Chapter 111 Sixth Year Separation Remus woke up the next morning with a hangover and an enormous sense of relief. He'd had to be drunk to do it, but it was done. No more jealousy, no more worrying, no more anxious questioning. The key now, he decided, was maintaining a distance and building barriers. By the time he'd finished his shower on the morning of his 17th birthday, Remus had a plan of action. He would close the door on whatever his relationship with Sirius had been. It was fine to look upon Christmas as a fond memory, or to feel a little bit lonelier, a little less whole, but this was entirely necessary for both his health and his sanity. Sirius was not the whole world, as much as he might seem it sometimes. Remus had demonstrated this almost immediately. Upon exiting the bathroom, he bumped into James, who looked as though he hadn't touched a drop of liquor the night before, despite having had just as much as everyone else. That infuriating Potter good fortune apparently applied to hangovers, too. "'Morning, Mooney,' he grinned, rosy-cheeked in his Quidditch robes. Today was not a practice day, but why would that stop James? He raised his broom. "'Fancy a spin around the pitch?' This was an old joke. He always asked, and Remus always pulled a face. Remus glanced at the two made beds, and the two with the curtains still closed were, presumably, Peter and Sirius still fast asleep. Yeah, Remus said. Go on, then. Huh? James stopped in his tracks. Remus nodded casually. I'll go with you. I ought to get better at flying. Might be useful when we finish school. I've got your old broom somewhere. Let me dig it out. Credit to James. After his initial surprise, he was all for the idea, and even held his tongue when he saw the state of Remus's dusty, neglected broomstick. He simply offered to polish it, then led Remus down to the Quidditch pitch, jabbering about simple basic exercises to get your confidence up. And it wasn't awful. James was a very patient teacher, and Remus felt in safe hands. The bespeckled boy didn't even laugh after the third time he fell off. Afterwards, a very wholesome feeling, walking back to breakfast, hungry and aching and full of energy. This first experiment had gone so well, in fact, that Remus decided he would say yes to anything his friends asked of him from now on. In this way, he could keep himself busy until Sirius went back to being whatever he'd been before. At breakfast, they were greeted by a row of red-eyed, sickly-faced Gryffindors, all leaning sleepily on their elbows, Mary and Marlene sitting back to back, propping each other up. Christ! Mary squinted at James and Remus. You've not been exercising? Bloody lunatics. You went, Mooney? Sirius looked up, wincing and rubbing his apparently sore neck. Remus just gave him a small shrug, then looked away. Sirius didn't try to talk to him again. They were halfway through the meal, Remus as usual eating half his body weight in fried bread, eggs, baked beans and bacon everyone else picking at their own plate with faintly nauseous expressions or else nursing a large mug of black coffee, when Lily straightened up, eyes wide as suddenly as if electrified. Oh, shit, she said, then kicked James under the table. Potter, she hissed. We never gave Remus his present. James smirked at her and Remus raised an eyebrow. You and James got me a present. Together. We all did, James laughed. And there's no need to beat me up, Evans. I've got it right here. He withdrew a brown leather box from his robes. It was about the size of his hand, smooth and expensive looking, with a gold embossed border. It looked like the sort of things girls kept their pricier jewellery in. You all, Remus accepted the box curiously. I hope you didn't spend too much. You know I can't... Oh, shut your face, Mooney, Peter yawned, prodding his porridge dazedly. We had a whip round for you. Almost everyone in Gryffindor wanted to put in. Not just Gryffindor either, Marlene grinned. Nearly everyone asked, even some teachers. Remus was just looking down at the box, because he knew he'd probably gone red. Some hot, sickly bubble of emotion was burning his throat, so he swallowed hard, which didn't help. Open it, Remus, he heard Lily's voice. He pried it apart and the box sprang open in a pleasing, neat motion. The interior was midnight blue velvet, and nestled among the folds was the most beautiful piece of treasure Remus had ever seen. 
It was a golden pocket watch on a long, fine chain, polished to a high shine so that it was practically glowing. The case was decorated with intricate vine-like swirls and patterns surrounding a shield at the centre which had been engraved in elaborate script with his initials, R.J.L. He snapped it open with the lightest touch and saw inside that the clock face was mother of pearl and shimmered gorgeously beneath the golden hands which ticked away reassuringly. The other half seemed to contain a compass. "'I didn't think these worked at Hogwarts,' he murmured. "'It's special!' Mary said eagerly. It doesn't point north or whatever normal ones do. If you say the name of somebody you love, it points in their direction. Try it out, Mooney, James encouraged. Remus looked up at his friends nervously, then raised the watch to his mouth and whispered, Lily Evans. At once the needle spun into place, pointing directly across the table. Lily grinned bashfully. James kicked him under the table. Bloody ladies, man. You're all amazing, Remus said, hoping he didn't sound too choked up. Bloody amazing. For the first week, Remus's new regime seemed pretty effective. It certainly kept him busy. He said yes to everything, happily dropping whatever he was doing at a moment's notice to help a younger student with their homework a call a group study session with the Care of Magical Creatures NEWT's class panicked over sphinxes. He accompanied Lily on patrols, he discussed literature with Chris, talked Quidditch tactics with Marlene, and played endless games of chess with Peter, and lost every time. He was the angel of Gryffindor Tower. Because Sirius was not the only thing Remus was ignoring. The old shoebox Dumbledore had given him sat under his bed still, gathering dust and unopened as if it had been there for many years, perhaps on some shelf in Matron's office. Why was it a shoebox? Remus wondered as he tossed and turned in his bed every night. Something so mundane, so every day. It made whatever was inside seem all the more terrifying. Trust Matron to be so heartlessly practical. It wasn't even a good shoe box like Clark's or Johnson's. It was an economy brand, like everything else he'd ever received at St. Edmund's. The box might have contained any number of things, and it wasn't that Remus wasn't curious. It wasn't as if he didn't try to imagine what was in there. Deeds to a house that he could go and live in. That would be pretty brilliant. Maybe some old money, photographs, a letter from his father, an explanation. It might contain answers to questions he didn't even know to ask. But he didn't open it. He knew that once he opened the box, all the mystery would disappear, and he would be left with something disappointing, because there could be nothing inside that could truly satisfy him. So keeping busy helped, making sure he exhausted himself each day so that he fell straight to sleep each night, even when the other boys stayed up chatting, plotting pranks, but Sirius himself helped too. By some incredible twist of fate, he appeared to be giving Remus space. If Sirius remembered Remus's harsh words from the night of the party, then he didn't mention it. But he didn't try to get him alone or treat him with any kind of resentment or disdain. Remus surmised that Sirius had either, one, been too drunk to take anything in, or, two, taken Remus at his word and chosen to back away quietly. For Remus, with exams on the horizon, option two was by far the most preferable, so he decided to believe it. Their separation was so smooth and so complete that soon even Remus had a hard time believing they'd ever been close at all. Surely to everyone else it would seem that nothing had changed at all. Sirius was still serious, outgoing, girl-loving, cheeky, rebellious, devastating. And Remus was just Remus. Quiet, private, studious and long-suffering secondary marauder. As March drew to a close, the birthday party now weeks behind them, there was only one moment when the situation very nearly came to a head, but was quickly deflated with the help of from an unexpected quarter. It was late one Friday afternoon, and Remus was hosting an introductory dueling workshop. Christopher was there. Christopher was never far away these days. But most of the class were beginners, and much younger. They were grasping for some basic disarming and diversionary spells when the door to the charms room classroom opened, but no one walked in. Everyone turned to look and muttered, Peeves, before returning to their attack stances. Remus knew better. He followed the scent about the room and watched the open door of Flitwick's office move only very slightly, as if someone had brushed the handle on their way inside. Flitwick trusted Remus and left his office open in case they needed any equipment from inside. 
He kept a number of large mattresses, which were good for dueling, as well as an emergency healing kit in there. Remus cleared his throat. That's good. <clears throat> Keep practicing. Remember to enunciate nice and loudly for me. I'll be right back. He slipped round the edges of the room as he said this, then slipped inside the office. Sirius, Remus hissed. Get out. This isn't... I'm just hiding from Filch. Have a heart, Mooney. Sirius whipped back the invisibility cloak, a familiar grin on his face, the sort of grin that usually got him whatever he liked. Remus bristled. You've got the cloak. Hide somewhere else. I'm nearly finished in here anyway. I'll be leaving in a minute. Well, then it's no big deal, is it? I'll just stay till they're all done. Might even learn something. Remus, are you okay in there? A tap at the door. Christopher. Yeah, sorry. Remus gave Sirius one last furious glance before stepping out. Sirius grinned and vanished again. Remus left the door open and he knew that Sirius had got bored and left the office. Remus pictured him leaning casually against the wall, observing with a wry smile. Remus carried on teaching as best he could, trying to ignore the distraction. He felt horribly exposed being watched like that, knowing Sirius was so near. When class finally finished, Remus ushered them all out, saying the room was needed for something else. Everyone left, chattering excitedly about the weekend ahead. Everyone except Christopher. I'll help you clear up, he said eagerly as the last few students filtered out, shouting their goodbyes to Remus as they went. Christopher and Remus made short work of rearranging the charm's classroom, restoring it to its usual orderliness. He could feel Sirius watching them the whole time, the hairs on the back of his neck standing up. Did you read that book? Christopher asked. The Charioteer? Remus winced but nodded. Yeah, it was good. It had been good. Hard to read at points, worryingly relatable, but something of a relief too. I'm so glad you liked it. Christopher said. Remus could imagine Sirius pulling a face at Chris getting so excited over a book. What about the ending? Oh yeah, it was good. I liked it. Really? Christopher wrinkled his nose. I didn't. I wish Laurie had picked Andrew, don't you? Of course Christopher identified with Andrew, sweet and bookish and chaste. I liked Ralph, Remus shrugged. Even if he wasn't perfect, he was more... I don't know... Exciting? Remus had thought Ralph sounded really fucking sexy, actually, but he'd been picturing Sirius the whole time, which may have had a lot to do with it. He dearly hoped that if Sirius was eavesdropping, and of course he was, he was serious after all, that he didn't understand a word Christopher was saying. I thought you'd like him best, Christopher said with a note of sadness. He was standing next to Remus now, his satchel over one shoulder ready to go. Just go, Remus begged inwardly. He reminded me a bit of your friend, Sirius Black. No? That got his attention, and Sirius's too. Remus could practically feel him straighten up. Yeah, Christopher smiled coyly. Sorry, but it's pretty obvious you've got a bit of a thing for him. Remus just blinked, struck dumb. Christopher laughed softly. It's a waste of time, Remus, can't you see that? Yeah, he's beautiful and everything, but he's clearly girl-mad. You ought to... I mean, you deserve someone who cares about you as much as you care about them. Christopher, I don't... Christopher cut him off with a kiss. He just reached up and kissed Remus as if it were that easy. Remus's first instinct was to push him away. This was nothing like what he'd wanted. Fortunately, it was only the briefest brush of a kiss. Oh, Chris... Remus breathed. I... You're such a good mate, and... Oh, shit. He should not have said mate. Mate was the worst possible word. He could practically see Christopher's heart break, but only for a moment, before that pure blood, stiff upper lip took over. He shook his head, stepped back. It's fine. Honestly. I'd rather be friends than not, if that's all we can be. Remus ached. Come on, Christopher smiled as if nothing had happened. It's steak and kidney pie tonight, your favourite. They left the classroom, just the two of them, and Remus quietly closed the door behind him to avoid suspicion. Chapter 112 Six Year 
apparitions. Sirius didn't show up for dinner. Emmeline wandered over and asked James where he was, but James just shrugged. Sorry, he said. We were on a mission earlier, but I lost track of him. Hope Filch never caught him. And why would Filch be looking for Sirius? Lily asked, setting down her knife and fork and giving James a very direct look. Uh, I'm sure I don't know, James said quickly, staring at his mashed potato as if it was the most fascinating thing in the world. Twenty minutes later, the prefects were summoned to an emergency meeting to discuss a problem on the fifth floor. All the suits of armour had apparently begun singing opera. All of the students were ordered to their common rooms for the rest of the evening, and when Peter, Remus, Marlene and Mary reached the tower, they found Sirius there, sitting in front of the fireplace, smoking. Where did he get the fags? Remus wondered. He usually asks me. Sirius Black was not the type to buy his own cigarettes. He was a professional borrower. All right, Black, Mary asked cheerfully. Yeah, fine, Sirius grunted, still staring at the fire. What, hungry? she asked. Nope, he inhaled and puffed out like a restless dragon. Ah, Mary raised a knowing eyebrow and looked at the others. In one of your moods, I see. He did not respond to this. Remus often forgot how well Mary knew Sirius. He admired the breezy, no-nonsense way she dealt with him. His own instinct was often to coddle and give in. He ought to take a leaf out of Mary's book, he thought. When Christopher returned from the prefect's meeting, Remus stuck to him like glue for as long as possible, partly because he knew he'd hurt him and he wanted to show him that nothing had changed, partly because he knew that Sirius wouldn't come anywhere near them while they were together. They sat on the window seat at the back of the room furthest from the fireplace. It was the same place Sirius had sat with Remus only a few months ago, where they'd argued then made up. But he wasn't thinking about it. He was listening to Christopher's rundown of the prefect's meeting. And everybody knows Potter's probably had something to do with it, but obviously there's no proof because he's basically a professional vandal and everyone loves him, so he gets away with it. Even Lily Evans has given up. She never takes him to task like she used to. Really? Remus feigned interest, watching the back of Sirius's armchair. Yeah, Christopher nodded. She's gone soft on him. I even asked her what she thought should be done to punish the pranksters and she actually giggled. She said it was really quite funny, and as it hadn't hurt anyone, that I should lighten up. I used to really look up to her, you know. Maybe you should lighten up, Remus sighed. It does sound like it was funny. God knows we could all do with a laugh. Prefects are supposed to uphold all the rules, Christopher replied, an echo of McGonagall in his voice. Not just the boring ones. Anyway, if that's how you feel, I don't know why I even bother. He started to get up. Chris! Remus looked up at him. Come on, don't be like that. I'll quiz you on runes, if you like. I don't feel like it, Christopher replied snippily. I'm going to bed. He walked off toward the dorms. Remus sighed again and rubbed his eyes. He'd give it a few moments and go up himself. It had been a trying sort of day. But of course it wasn't over. No sooner had Remus brushed his teeth and changed into his pyjamas than Sirius had taken his opportunity. He was standing in the dorm room with a face like thunder, arms folded. Remus felt it a bit of a disadvantage in his night things and bare feet, but he tried to remain stoic and nodded. Hello, Sirius. I'm just going to bed. He tried to walk toward his side of the room, but Sirius blocked him. You really pissed me off, you know that? he said furiously. Excuse me, Remus reeled back, frowning. Sirius carried on, practically ranting. If you were trying to make me jealous, then I think it's really bloody low of you, Remus. Remus rolled his eyes, which he knew would rile Sirius up even more. Oh, of course, he said sarcastically. Everything's about you, isn't it? For God's sake, you weren't even supposed to be there, so why don't you just... Why didn't you just leave with the rest of the group? I thought you'd want to go down to dinner together. How was I supposed to know you've been having secret trysts with that... that... I haven't been having secret trysts with anyone but you, you idiot, Remus spat, and you've already made me regret that. Christopher is my friend, and either way, it's none of your bloody business, so keep your nose out. Fine, Sirius shouted. If that's what you want. I said so, didn't I? Remus was so furious, so angry, that he knew if he stayed much longer he'd do something he regretted. 
They both liked the last word in an argument, and it was one of the only ways they were similar. As he had nowhere to go, he pushed past Sirius to his bed and shut the curtain so vigorously he almost ripped the rings from its frame. In a few moments, he heard Sirius's angry footsteps stomping down the stairs. Well, Remus thought, if he didn't get the message before, he's got it now. Monday, 4th of April, 1977 Inconveniently enough, the very first apparition lesson of the year happened to fall on the April full moon. Remus was already intensely nervous, in that shaky, sweaty sort of way, about these lessons. Add to that the challenge he usually had keeping his magic under control in the days preceding the moon, and he was sure it was a recipe for disaster. "'I might end up on the other side of the country,' he said in a low voice to Lily as they queued up outside the great hall. "'You can't,' she assured him. "'I asked Professor McGonagall. They've only lifted the anti-apparition measures on the hall, so I don't think you can get outside of it.' "'Really? That's good,' he nodded, trying to calm himself. It had been unendingly useful having Lily aware of the furry little problem. She was much better at common sense than James Osirius. "'Anyway,' she whispered, "'you should stop acting like it's a bad thing, being extra strong sometimes. I'd have thought it was an advantage, especially for someone as clever as you.' That struck him in a funny way. No one had ever suggested he try to be positive about his problem before. Well, except for Livia. You don't know half the power you hold, Remus Lupin. Inside the hall, Professor McGonagall introduced the eager sixth and seventh years to the tall, spindly ministry official who was there to teach them apparition. Remus had, of course, done a fair bit of reading on the subject and already knew about the three Ds, but he'd rather hoped there'd be more to it than that. After much... Too little instruction, in Remus's opinion, the students were given wooden hoops, asked to simply have a go. He caught Mary's eye as they carried their hoops to a free space. She pulled a bug-eyed face and he laughed, which earned a stern look from the instructor. Not wanting to make a bad impression, Remus refocused his attention on the hoop. It was very difficult to concentrate when everyone around you was twirling on the spot, tripping and stumbling, like puppies being trained to roll over. Still, Remus closed his eyes and tried. Deliberation. Best not take it too fast, like flying a broom. Slow and steady wins the race. Determination. He really, really wanted to beat Sirius. Destination. The hoop wasn't even that far away. He'd sidled along further that time with Mr. Potter. Remus tried to recall how that had felt, the magic pulling him forward. No, more like, more like following a channel, like water swirling down a bathtub drain. If you pressed your fingertips against the holes, you could feel the vacuum sucking. It was a bit like that. Bollocks! A shout went up, causing a lapse in Remus's concentration. He opened his eyes in time to see James and Sirius sitting dazed on the floor, staring at each other, confused, rubbing their heads. Oh no, he thought. Do they do it already? Idiots! Mary laughed. Everyone else was laughing too, and Sirius was looking extremely put out as he climbed to his feet and dusted off his robes with a dignified sniff. What happened? Remus asked. They both jumped at the same time and hit each other, she snorted. Silly buggers. I'm not feeling anything, are you? Remus shook his head. He closed his eyes again and concentrated as hard as he could, feeling for whatever it might be that would pull him in the right direction. He thought he had it, tried twirling, but got nowhere. At least he didn't fall over. Something wasn't right. This was like the stupid Patronus thing all over again. He still hadn't managed one. He was one of the only ones who hadn't. Even Peter had produced a wispy bit of silver. Only the trick to that was having a happy thought, and Remus accepted that happy thoughts were not his forte. This, however, this required determination, and wasn't he determined? Just then, the ministry-sanctioned apparition instructor wafted past, and Remus caught a whiff of his magic. It was peculiar and strong, like buzzing. It reminded him of the old TV in the rec room at St. Edmund's, gathered a fuzz of static to the screen. As a child, Remus had held his hands up to it in wonder and stroked the bizarre, otherworldly energy, as if he could absorb it. There was a snap in Remus's mind like ice cracking. That was it. Remus relaxed his body. He didn't have to look for the right channel or try to feel it out. He could already feel it. 
The room was full of magic, thick and iron-like and hot-cold against his teeth. He could always sense it, he'd just learned to tune it out over the years. That was harder to do on a full moon, but in this scenario that might not be a disadvantage, as Lily had said. He closed his eyes, breathed in and moved. It felt like only the slightest twitch, a wand flick or the quirk of an eyebrow. He let the magic do all the work, and when he opened his eyes with a gasp, he was inside the hoop. Bravo! The instructor was clapping his spindly hands together delicately, noiselessly. Nice one, Mooney! James called across the room, a large egg-shaped bruise growing on his forehead. Well done, Remus! The girls cheered. Remus looked at his feet, embarrassed but thrilled. Friday, 15th of April, 1977. By mid-April, there seemed to be no limits to Remus's newfound confidence. He was cautious about it, of course. He didn't tell anybody. Perish the thought, in case they might think him arrogant, or even worse, dangerous. But he knew that something had changed. For many years now, Remus had considered his lycanthropy and the uncontrollable feelings and senses which arose from it as a limitation on his magic. If the past few weeks were an indication of anything, this had been incorrect. Perhaps this misunderstanding was simply due to the fact that too little study had been done on werewolves in the wizarding world. Or perhaps Livia had been right. Remus had been instructed by the wrong people all along. Now, in private, he carried out various experiments, from simple basic spells to much more complex transfiguration and transmutation. All of them came much easier when he relaxed, when he harnessed whatever magic was already there in the space around him. Before, casting a spell had been like drawing water up from a well inside him, a heavy bucket in a winch. After the apparition discovery, he felt as though he'd been standing in a lake all along, and all he needed to do was drink. He hadn't even begun to make steps towards wordless magic. In the meantime, he had exams to prepare for, and with his new frown strength, it would certainly be useful in the practical exams. Remus still had to complete several written papers. On this particular afternoon, he'd convinced James, and by extension Peter, to revise along with him. It was a bright spring day, and the last chills of winter had eked out enough that they'd all agreed it would be nice to sit outside for a change. They sprawled on the grass, books open, James reading with his tongue between his teeth and a quill behind his ear, Peter half-heartedly jotting down notes on hinky punks. "'It's not fair,' he whinged. "'It's not N-E-W-T's or O-W-L's this year. Why have we got to do exams at all?' "'Wouldn't want to lose your edge, Wormy,' James replied, still gro engrossed in the book. "'Think of it as practice for N-E-W-T's.' "'Rather not,' Peter pulled a face. Mooney, do you have the notes for Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays? Remus said promptly, not looking up from his DADA essay. What? Peter scratched his head. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays, Remus repeated. Those are the days I hold my study groups, and those are the days I help other people with their work. I need the rest of the time to catch up on my own stuff. Mm, but I'm your best friend, Peter moaned. Pleased, Mooney. Less time snogging Dorcas, more time organising your notes, Remus smirked. It was very easy to be pious when you weren't allowed to snog the people you wanted to snog. Speaking of which... All right, lads, Sirius came sauntering across the lawn toward them, Emmeline trotting on behind. James looked up and grinned. Peter moved to make a space. Where have you been? James asked. Never see you these days. Not my fault you've become one of them, Prefect Potter, Sirius replied coolly. I had detention. You're in detention more often than I'm doing anything prefectish, James countered, no longer reading his book, now back in marauder mode. He looked at Emmeline, who sat primly beside Sirius, smoothing her skirt down. All right, Em. Hi, James, she smiled back at him. Peter, Remus, are you all revising? "'Unfortunately,' Peter groaned. "'Mooney's not helping me, though.' "'No, help yourself for once,' Remus snapped, no longer lightly teasing. "'I think it's a good idea,' Emmeline said encouragingly. "'Get it out of the way before Hogsmeade this weekend. "'I think it's responsible. Don't you, Sirius?' "'Spose.' "'Speaking of,' she continued, ignoring his brush off, "'what do you fancy doing in Hogsmeade?' Will I meet you there? Will you pick me up outside my common room? 
Uh, I don't know. Why does it have to be a big deal? Peter, despite his earlier despair, suddenly became very fascinated by his DADA notes, head bowed over the parchment. Other boys don't mind making plans to take their girlfriends out, Emmeline said, her voice edging on shrill. This was clearly old ground for him. Like Peter, James and Remus began to concentrate on their books and notes as if their lives depended on it. Sirius and Emmeline carried on bickering regardless. I'm not other boys, Sirius growled. I thought you liked that. So did I, she shot back. So what? I'm a terrible boyfriend because I don't want to trail around after you like some soppy git. That's not what I'm asking and you know it. Stop complaining then. I'm not compl- Sounds like it. Moan, moan, moan. Emmeline opened and closed her mouth a few times, clearly wanting to say something back, but not wanting it to sound like moaning. Finally, she sat in silence, staring at the ground. Her eyes looked a bit brighter than usual, and Remus finally felt himself softening toward her. Poor girl. Oh, Merlin, don't sulk, Sirius complained at her silence. If you're angry, then let's have a fight. If you're okay, then give us a snog. But please don't sulk. Ugh! And those are the only two options with you, aren't they, Sirius? Emmeline snapped, climbing to her feet and folding her arms across her chest. Yes, he replied, grinning that serious black grin. She threw up her hands and stormed away, back toward the castle. Once she was gone, there was only the uncomfortable silence left. James cleared his throat. Not very nice, Pads, he handed over his textbook. She's upset now. She's always upset. Sirius whined. What about my feelings? I'm not convinced you have any, James said without missing a beat. What do you think, Mooney? Remus glanced up from his book, hoping he looked harassed and uninterested, as if he hadn't been paying rapt attention. Hmm? Does Padfoot have feelings? Sirius caught his eye. Remus straightened his back, looked away. Definitely not. Sirius stood up without a word and left. Sirius! Oi! James stood, but Sirius did not look back. James scratched his head, sitting back down uneasily. He was thoughtful for a moment before looking at Remus. Mooney, is something going on between you? Remus glared at him. Ask him! I did. He won't say anything. Really? Remus was genuinely surprised. He'd been half certain Sirius had told him every filthy detail. He must be really ashamed. Really? James was looking at him very intensely now. What's going on? I... I slept with Mary. At least it was true. Peter made an odd sort of gasp beside him, but Remus ignored it. He found out, that's all. You... what? James's eyebrows shot up in unmasked surprise. He quickly rearranged his features, clearing his throat. Oh, well, good on you, mate. I had no idea you and she... Just a one-off thing, Remus said quickly. Oh, okay, right, well, why Sirius in a mood about it? He and Mary broke up ages ago. Yeah, Remus replied glumly. He sighed. Oh, go on then, Pete. Borrow my notes. What bit are you stuck on? Chapter 113, Sixth Year the box. The Quidditch stands on a Sunday were one of the only places you were guaranteed some peace and quiet at Hogwarts. Remus had been going there every week since his birthday to catch the tail end of James's Spartan training sessions and to have a flying lesson of his own afterwards. This morning, however, as he limped onto the stands, he found he was not alone. Hi, Lily, Remus beamed, surprised. What are you doing here? Lily spun round and blinked at him, mouth open in a small pink O, as if she'd not expected anyone else. Her eyes darted to the pitch, then back to Remus nervously, and she gave a sheepish grin. Hi! Um, just watching Miles practice? Moral support and all that? Oh, right. Mind if I join you? She smiled and shifted her bag, as if to make room for him, though the stands were completely empty. They sat quietly and watched the practice for a bit. James was drilling the chasers and the keeper, so only half the team were here today. 
Ramus vaguely remembered James's focus sessions initiative, which had come as a relief to the rest of the Gryffindor team, as it meant they didn't actually have to practice every day, even if James did. Uh, Lily, Remus said after a while, did you know Marlene isn't practicing today? She looked down at her knees, her hair falling in a coppery sheet in front of her face. Yes, she whispered. So you're here to watch? Don't make me say it, Remus. She sounded defeated. She raised her head, pushed her hair behind her ear. Go on, then. Let me have it. What? Remus was amused. Perfect Lily Evans all come undone. Sirius would love it. Tease me, make fun of me, tell me I'm a complete idiot. She sighed, looking out at the pitch. I already know. I don't think you're an idiot just for fancying James. Remus laughed, nudging her jovially. But, I mean, it is a bit funny, after all this time. Ugh, I know, she groaned. I can't bloody believe it. Does he know? No! She stared at him in disbelief. I'd absolutely die. Why? Remus laughed again. You honestly think he'd turn you down? He's been hoping for this exact thing for five years. Exactly, she said, gesturing wildly with her hands, spreading out her fingers in every show of exasperation. He's wanted it forever, and I've only wanted it for, um, well, maybe a little while, actually, but nowhere near as long. If I give in now, he's so intense, I might break his heart. She bit her lip, still watching him flying, blowing his whistle and pointing emphatically at the goal rings. You might, Remus agreed, but I think James Potter would consider it an honour to have his heart broken by you. She snorted. Remus, honestly, you sound as bad as he does. I'm not this, I don't know, perfect dream girl who's going to breeze into his life and make all the crap stuff wonderful. It's not a fairy tale. I'm not a fairy tale. I'm really annoying. I'm a complete mess in the mornings, ask Mary, and I hate losing arguments, and I shout when I'm angry, and my nose runs when I cry. I don't know about Quidditch, and I really don't want to learn, either. So? Remus smiled. I'm pretty sure he knows most of that. If he doesn't, then I don't think it'll hurt him to find out. Anyway, it's not as if James is perfect. I've smelled his socks. Lily laughed. Thanks, Remus. Gonna tell him? She wrinkled her freckled nose. Nah, want to think about it a bit more first. Just gonna stare at him riding his broom for hours instead. She shoved him, laughing. If I want to. He's easy on the eye, what can I say? She poked out her tongue and returned to gawping. Remus smiled and dredged up the only real piece of advice he had. Don't give it too long. It gets harder the longer you wait. Lily looked at him curiously, and Remus instantly regretted saying anything. Oh, yeah, she said. You seem very wise in the ways of love, all of a sudden. Nah, he laughed. He hoped convincingly. I just read lots. Black, next time you decide to break someone's heart, can you do it outside the exam period? Lily groaned as Sirius entered the common room and every radio turntable and gramophone within twenty metres began blaring P.P. P. Arnold's tragedy-stricken voice. "'What do you want me to do about it?' Sirius raged, storming out about the room, trying to mute every speaker in sight. It had been a plain, drawn-out melodrama, but Emmeline and Sirius had finally split. And apparently nobody treated Emmeline Vance like that. So in retaliation, she'd placed a very advanced hex on him, which meant that every time he entered a room, a breakup song began to play. This was usually limited to music players, but occasionally, when there was nothing else about, the portraits had begun to burst into song too. Just apologise to her and get the bloody spell lifted, Lily replied. I've got nothing to apologise for, he spat back forcely. Silencio! 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 The music finally stopped. Who knew for how long? Remus didn't get involved. He could only make it worse, and Sirius had been in a foul mood all week. Gotta give it to the girl, Mary said. She's creative. 
She was straddling Marlene, who lay on her front on the rug, Mary plaiting her long blonde hair. Every time she got to the end, she would unravel it, comb it out gently, and begin again. Sometimes Remus didn't think he'd ever understand girls. Still, Marlene, who usually hated being fussed over, seemed to be quite enjoying it. She looked very peaceful. Oh yeah, go on, take her side, you lot. Bloody women. Sirius threw himself into an armchair opposite Lily and slouched into it, glaring at the fire. Anyone got a fag? Remus did, but he didn't say anything. No surprise she dumped you, Mary grinned. You're a miserable git these days. I'm well shot of you. She gave him a joking wink and his frown diminished. You love me, really, he muttered. Let's talk about something else, Mary said from the floor. Not exams or bloody relationships. Potter, what's going on with this camping trip? All sorted. You lot just need to show up, James grinned. With your tents, obviously. Dad says I can borrow the family ones as long as I take care of them, Lily said. Two two sleepers. Cozy, Sirius said sarcastically. With seven of us going. Eight, Peter piped up. James said I could bring Dorcas. Remus groaned inwardly at that. Not that he didn't like Dorcas, Dorcas was fine, but he'd been looking forward to a summer holiday with all of his closest friends, not tagalongs. Thank goodness Mary wasn't bringing her latest boyfriend, though with Mary the turnover was too fast to make any kind of long-term plans. Well, I was rather hoping that you boys would bring your own tent, actually, Lily replied, giving Sirius a frosty look. Mum said in her last letter there's a muggle camping supply shop in our village, James said quickly, ever the peacemaker. So we'll go get ours as soon as we're home. You're definitely coming to stay this summer, right, Mooney? Is that still okay? Remus asked anxiously. He still didn't have a plan B. Maybe James would let him keep one of the tents afterward. Ugh, what a depressing thought. Of course, James grinned mag magnanimously, rubbing his hands together. This summer is going to be great. How are we going to get to Cornwall? Marlene asked. Apparating? If we've all passed, yeah. They looked at Peter guiltily. He'd still not quite managed to get anywhere without splinching himself yet. I'm really trying, he said, embarrassed. I could get the night bus. It'll be fine, James said cheerily. I promise. Best summer ever. Friday, 24th of June, 1977. And really, Remus thought to himself as he left his last exam of the term, Care of Magical Creatures written, thank goodness for James' eternal optimism. It was one of the only things that kept any of them going these days. Exams were the same as they ever had been. Easier, maybe, at least when it came to practical magic. Fortunately, no one expected a Patronus this year. There was something reassuring about a timetable, though, and deadlines and timed exercises. It all made good common sense and didn't encourage too much independent thought. Remus was always grateful for an opportunity to switch off his brain, especially as he'd set himself a very personal deadline of his own. Once his final exam was over, and today was the day, he would open the shoebox. He'd been sitting under his bed for the better part of three months now. He'd not so much as glanced at it. Whatever was in it would be disruptive, he knew that. Even if it was nothing more than some boring notes from Matron, old schoolwork or something, he knew that just thinking about the whole St. Edmund's problem was going to drag him down eventually. He told himself that it was very sensible and mature. He needed a clear head for exams. But it was late June now, and he had nothing left to do. Of course, there was always something to do. NEWTs would begin in earnest next year. He ought to get a head start. There was talk about an end-of-the-year party, and he could start preparing for that. He really ought to catch up on his reading for Madame Pomfrey's healing classes, too. He was woefully behind on bruises. He ate lunch first. Unpleasant experiences were generally better faced on a full stomach. There were exams scheduled that afternoon for muggle studies and divination, both of which James and Sirius were taking. Mooney, what are hot air balloons for? I still don't get it, James pleaded, looking very frazzled. You're fine, Lily said, pouring herself some pumpkin juice. Muggle studies should be easy for you after advanced transfiguration. Wow, thanks, Evans, James beamed. Everyone looked at Lily, who blushed and returned to her food. I've still never seen anything in a crystal ball, Peter sighed deeply. Tell her you see a grim, Sirius said cheerfully. That's what I'm doing. 
Why a grim? I just have a feeling she might actually see one tomorrow at about two o'clock, Sirius smirked. James and Peter began to laugh, much to the girl's confusion. Remus loitered outside the Great Hall for as long as he could with his friends, until they all had to go in for the exam. Putting it off a few minutes wouldn't hurt, but eventually it was time to face the music. After all, the sooner he did it, the longer he'd have by himself to actually process it. Even if it was nothing, even if he only had to cope with another disappointment, he had a good book on hand and full access to Sirius's record collection, so the afternoon didn't have to be totally unpleasant. He drew the curtains round his bed, even though he was alone in the dorm room. He blew the dust from the cardboard lid, and it made him cough. Scourgeify, he choked, aiming his wand at his sheets to rid them of the nasty grey matter, now going back. As quickly as ripping off a plaster, he lifted the lid. At first, it all looked completely harmless. Everything inside was flat. Papers, presumably sorted into neat brown envelopes of various sizes, varying ages. His admission papers to St. Edmund's. Remus John Lupin, five years, three months. Arrival date, 12-7-1965. Reports written by his primary school teachers. All of the marks were poor. Shows very little aptitude for academia, one read. Incapable of learning. May suit unskilled work. Fucking bitches. His birth certificate. It was a muggle one. He supposed his mother had not been admitted to St. Mungo's. Remus learned he'd been born at home in Bristol, of all places. His mother's name was Hope, and his father was listed as unemployed. Of all this, Remus worked through with impassive patience, like an archiver sifting through documents related to some ancient history, not his own life. But then he came to the photographs. They were black and white, muggle, unmoving. One of a chubby baby dressed in some white knitted affair, with buttons shaped like bunny rabbits. Remus supposed it was him, there was nothing written on the back, only the stamp from Boots. There was another which would have been taken when he arrived at St. Edmund's. In it, he was able to recognise some features. The dark, cautious stare, the mouth set in a determined grimace. He was looking up, at whoever was taking the photo, presumably, and he looked frightened. The last picture was the worst. It was of a family he didn't remember. There was Lyle, tall and slim and gangly, tousled hair and small wire-framed spectacles. He was smiling. Remus never pictured him smiling. Sitting in a floral armchair beside him was a small, very young-looking woman. She had immaculate platinum blonde hair and a proper sixties beehive, and she was wearing a neat shirtwaister which showed off her pretty figure. Her nose was a bit long and beakish, but she had a nice face. On her lap was a little boy, giggling, his face all creased up with joy. She was looking at him. Her mouth was open. What has she been saying? Remus put it down, feeling lightheaded. He realised he'd been holding his breath for a long time and exhaled. There was one envelope left. The handwriting on it was not Matron's. It hadn't been sealed, though, so maybe she'd read it before. Maybe that's why she didn't give it to him. Stealing himself once more, Remus pulled out a letter, folded neatly in thirds. It was written on pretty notepaper with a floral design on the borders. The handwriting was pretty too. My darling boy, I know I have no right to leave you this letter. It may be a good few years before you receive it, if you receive it at all. I hope that you do, and I hope that when you do, you'll be owed enough. Still, I don't expect forgiveness. I can't think what to tell you. How can I explain? You were my beautiful, precious boy from the moment you were born. No, from the moment I felt you move inside me. Your father and I loved each other very much, and having you tripled our happiness a thousand times over. You were loved, my little Remus. I pray you haven't forgotten it. But you're very young, and they tell me that sometimes forgetting is kindness. When the accident happened, I promised you I would do everything I could to make it right again. I had some stupid idea that just loving you would be enough. Then when Lyle left us both, I tried for you. I swear I tried. But I was never a very clever girl, and never as strong or as practical as your father. You needed so much and I had so little. I had no family once I married him, you see. They told me to make a choice. My parents didn't approve, and even after he'd gone, I knew they wouldn't approve of you. I can't say how sorry I am to let you go. 
In my heart, I know it's the safest thing and the best for you in the end. And I know you will never forgive me, and I know I will always long to see you again. I pray that when that time comes, I shall not be difficult for you to find. All my love, Hope Jenkins. Remus put the letter back in the envelope and closed the box. He threw the box under the bed. He climbed underneath his heavy covers and curled up small like he used to at St. Edmund's. He felt as if a hole had been opened up inside him, a big, gaping emptiness. Tears picked his eyes, and because he was alone, he let them come. Saturday, 2nd of July, 1977 He'd never given his mother much thought, at least not since he'd been at Hogwarts, which seemed so full of Lyle and all his achievements and mistakes. Obviously, it would have been better to have a mother than not, but he wasn't sure what he'd been missing all the same. Matron hadn't been very maternal, but she wasn't paid to love the boys she looked after. This window into Hope's life, into his own life, was terrifying to Remus, and he wished he'd never read the stupid letter. Still, he read it more than once, he read it every night for the rest of term as if reading the word loved could make him feel it. It couldn't. The marauder stayed an extra two days at Hogwarts for Remus's sake. The first full moon of the summer fell on the 1st of July and it was more convenient, not to mention safer for the Potters, if Remus went into the Shrieking Shack. Well, he was supposed to go into the Shrieking Shack, but of course Wormtail, Padfoot and Prongs had other ideas. Free of exams and excited about the summer, they had one of the best full moon nights they had in ages. Still, Madame Pomfrey insisted on the usual course of aftercare and knocked Remus out with a strong sleeping draught to ensure he rested through the next morning. Travelling by flu powder can make you queasy at the best of times, she cautioned. Better safe than sorry. They were due to travel that evening using the fireplace in McGonagall's office. Remus woke up just after lunch and found he was not alone. Hiya, Mooney. Sirius said softly, sitting in the chair by his bed. His eyes were dark. He looked as if he'd been dozing, too. Hiya, Remus echoed, sitting up, stretching. You ought to be in bed. You look knackered. Shut up. I look gorgeous, Sirius replied, yawning. Anyway, James is tearing the bedroom apart, trying to pack. I couldn't get any sleep. Hungry? Always. Good. I'm supposed to make sure you eat. He motioned to a plate sitting on the bedside table, loaded with fruit and sandwiches. Remus picked up an apple and bit into it, ravenous. Neither of them said much for a while, but Sirius ate a few grapes. Since March, they'd practiced the art of making small talk with as little detail or eye contact as possible. You could call it friendship if you didn't know what had come before. I feel a bit bad, Sirius said out of the blue, looking at his shoelaces. Hmm? I feel a bit bad about the way I spoke to you a while ago. About your friend, uh, Christopher? Yeah, Remus finished his apple core, down to the stem which he put down, reaching for a sandwich next. Cheese and pickle. You were a bit rude, but it's okay. I haven't thought about it much. Oh, that's good, Sirius nodded. He looked at Remus, then quickly diverted his gaze out the window. I thought maybe... I thought maybe he might be the reason you decided to stop. Remus didn't need to ask what he meant. Sirius was being very clear. No, Remus said, choosing his words carefully. It wasn't to do with him. I told you, he's my friend, that's all. Sirius nodded bravely. Yeah, I believe you. I do. He still didn't understand, Remus realised sadly. He still didn't know why they just couldn't carry on the way they were. Stupid, beautiful, impossible boy. Look, Sirius, he said, still cautious. I just... I've had a bit of a shit year, to be honest. Maybe I'm having a shit life, I don't know. There's just a lot of stuff going on at the moment that I really can't control. So the way I see it, if something's making me miserable that I can control, then... Oh, right. I get it. Yeah? I would never want to make you miserable, Mooney. That's not what I meant, Remus thought. That's not what I wanted to say. But he didn't have the energy for more. Didn't have the resources. It would have to do, at least until everything stopped being so raw. Are those voices I hear? 
Madame Pomfrey came bustling round the hospital curtain, merry and rose-cheeked. Well, you're looking much better. Looking forward to the summer, boys. Chapter 114 Summer, 1977 Part 1 Remus felt strangely untethered arriving at the Potters with all his earthly possessions, moving them into a temporary room. He was going to have to tell somebody what happened, and soon, if he could just get Mr. Potter on his own. But both of James's parents were busier than ever, running in and out of the house on errands, or holding secretive missions which the boys weren't allowed to attend. But we're all of age, James protested. You're still my little boy, though, Mrs. Potter kissed his head patronisingly as she cleared their breakfast plates. James looked highly insulted by this babying, but Remus's eyes pricked with tears and he had to excuse himself. They had a week to prepare for the camping trip, and on the very first day set off into the village to purchase a tent. Remus had never been camping in his life, but still found himself better equipped than James, Sirius, or Peter, who were in turns distracted, terrified, and fascinated by every single item in the shop. It fell to Remus to talk to the shopkeeper about boring things like ground sheets and pegs and rigging. In the end, he settled for two sensible brown and orange two-man tents, ignoring Sirius's pleading that he consider a blue and green psychedelic number. The next day, Remus had to check they all had appropriate muggle clothes, seeing as how they'd be using a muggle campsite. Then they got a crash course in cooking from Gully the house elf. Can't the girls do all the cooking? James whinged as the foul smell of burnt eggs filled the air. Mrs. Potter, who'd been watching with amusement, came up and slapped him lightly round the head. Some man I've raised here, she sniffed. If you can't cook a young lady breakfast, don't expect her to spend the night. Ugh, Mum, James scowled, repulsed, while Sirius and Remus were bent over laughing. They filled the rest of their time planning all of the things they would do with their holiday freedom, watching the matinee at the local cinema, there was a Bond film playing, and Airport 77, which was Remus's personal favourite, and of course flying their brooms. Sirius was very impressed by Remus's recent improvement, and they actually managed to organise a very small Quidditch game. Without the snitch, Peter is keeper. There was no sign of Moody this summer. Mr. Potter explained over dinner one night that security measures on their house had been increased and Moody was back in the Aura's office, managing things there. Remus was relieved. He'd tied Moody and Ferox together in his mind, muddled them all up with the Livia encounter and Dumbledore's cruel single-mindedness. All in all, after the year he'd had, Remus was looking forward to a few weeks away from anyone older than him. It was decided that they would all apparate to Cornwall, except for Peter, who'd failed his test. Mrs. Potter had kindly offered to take him as a side-along before disapparating back home, but Peter insisted on taking the night bus. This way, he decided, he could collect Dorcas on the way. The evening before they were set to leave, James, Sirius and Remus squeezed themselves into the red phone box at the end of the Potter's street to coordinate with what Sirius called the female contingent. "'Can I press the buttons, Mooney?' James asked, running his finger over the silvery keypad. "'Which bit do you talk into?' Sirius said, holding the receiver up to his eyes for inspection. "'Oh, for goodness sake, you two, calm down!' Remus dialed Lily's home number, snatching the black plastic receiver back. It rang for a bit, and he hoped that Lily would pick up the phone and not one of her parents. "'Good evening, Evan's household,' a young woman answered. "'Lily? Who's speaking, please?' Uh, Remus Lupin. There was a very rude, snorting laugh, then the person on the other end shouted away from the receiver, Lily, it's for you! Remus shifted from foot to foot, James and Sirius watching him eagerly. Thanks, pet, Lily's voice said on the other end. Don't be too long, I'm waiting for Vernon to call. Hello, Lily's voice became louder directly into the phone. Hi, Lily, it's Remus. Hi, Remus. Sorry, that was my sister. Are you all ready? Yep, I think so. Pete's left already, I think. You lot? Mary and Marlene got here just before tea. We agreed on one o'clock in the afternoon, didn't we? Yeah, one o'clock, just outside the campsite. I made James get a map. Oh, good. I think Mum's letting me borrow the A to Z. Cool. James was tugging on Remus's sleeve. He sighed. Uh, Lily... James and Sirius have never used a phone before. 
Can you talk to them for a minute so they'll leave me alone? Lily laughed. Go on, then. It'll wind Pet up. Remus leaned back against the glass panes and watched James and Sirius fight over the phone, taking turns to shout something at Lily, then press the receiver to their ears and listen with wonder. Night began to fall round them, and if anyone had walked past, they would have seen three village boys mucking about in a phone box without a care in the world. Saturday, 9th of July, 1977. Remus's first time apparating outside of Hogwarts could have gone a bit better, but at least he didn't end up in a tree like James did. He ended up, in fact, about half a mile south of the campsite, on the beach. He'd been to the seaside before, on summer trips at St Edmund's, three times to Margate, once to South End. He couldn't say he particularly enjoyed these outings, or at least he didn't enjoy them any more than he would have enjoyed sitting in the back garden at St Edmund's. They were busy, noisy places, full of crying children and barking dogs, and strange sugary smells and brightly coloured fairground rides. This beach was almost deserted except for a few kids, dots in the distance really, flying a pink and blue kite. The day was warm enough, the sky was blue, and the sand was soft and yellow. He knew he ought to start walking toward the campsite to find the others, but instead he sat down for a few minutes, just to look. The sea wasn't green or bright blue like in picture books. It was more of a concrete kind of grey, still pretty, glimmering under the midday sun. In the far-off distance, Remus could just about make out a long, dark shape on the horizon. Was that France? Might be. He could pretend it was. Remus hadn't been able to relax at the Potters. He'd felt like a visitor there, someone who didn't belong. He didn't know where he did belong. Now that he was seventeen, he could go anywhere he wanted. Would it be nice to live here, in Cornwall? He'd recently discovered he'd been born in Bristol and wondered what it was like there. That was by the sea, too. Remus had never thought he'd live anywhere else other than London. Once, he thought he would probably never leave Essex. Eventually, he felt too guilty and had to go look for the others. The walk was bracing, and after a year of being confined to Hogwarts, it was a thrill just to be able to go somewhere alone. The campsite itself was halfway up the beach on a long stretch of flat, neatly trimmed grass. A few families had already pitched tents, and the mothers and fathers were sitting outside them in deck chairs, soaking up the rare English summer sun with cups of tea and newspapers standing by. Mary, Marlene, James and Sirius were sitting on a picnic bench outside the site office, which was little more than a breeze-block hut. Mary and Marlene jumped up when they saw him. "'We thought we lost you!' "'Overshot,' he explained. Landed on the beach. Not in the water, luckily. We're all balls up a bit, Mary laughed, and they each recounted the strange places they'd ended up. Except for Lily, who'd arrived in precisely the place she'd meant to. She was inside the office, booking them in. This done, the party set about finding the perfect place to pitch their tents. James and Sirius decided this needed to be as close to the beach as possible. Then there was the matter of actually erecting the tents, which was endlessly fascinating to the two pure-blood boys. Lily took charge, channeling her prefect persona, reading out directions and barking out orders. No, not that hook. I said the one in the corner. Bloody hell, Black, use the flipping mallet, not your boot. Come on, chop chop, we haven't got all day. Blimey, Evans, James grinned, standing with his arms up, holding one of the poles in place while Mary and Marlene tried to get the canvas over it. Have you ever considered Quidditch coaching? You'd be incredible. Please, no, Marlene called out, muffled under the heavy fabric. I'll leave the team if I have to put up with both of you blowing whistles at me. It took almost two hours, but it was a huge amount of fun, and everyone was very pleased with themselves once all four tents were up in a neat row, facing out to sea. Well done, lads, Lily smiled, sitting cross-legged on the grass while they waited for the kettle to boil. And no magic at all. You'll make muggles yet. Peter and Dorcas arrived shortly after that, looking very rumpled and tired from their long journey on the night bus. It stopped at Guernsey twice before we even started south, Dorcas explained, looking vaguely disturbed. Peter accepted a cup of tea and sat in silence, yawning. Once they'd woken up a bit, Mary decided it was time to go to the beach. It was about three o'clock by then, but still very warm, and they had hours of daylight left. The girls disappeared into their tents to get into swimming costumes. James and Sirius had been so excited by the prospect of muggle swimming trunks that they'd been wearing them all day anyway, and Remus, 
still in jeans and long sleeves, wasn't planning to take off his clothes under any circumstances. He did remove his trainers and socks when they reached the sand, but ignored the others' pleas to join them in the sea. He was happy enough to sit on the bank, enjoying the warm sun on his back and listening to the seagull screaming overhead. The girls shrieked too as they dipped their toes in the icy cold water, and they made a game of running back and forth with the tide, daring each other to get in. James was knocked over by a wave when he wasn't looking, too busy staring at Lily's long, bare legs. Mind you, Remus caught her throwing a few longing glances at him too. Those muscles were pretty hard to ignore. Sirius, as usual, was in a league of his own. He strode out into the surf as if it was as warm as bath water, and as soon as he was waist-deep, dived right under, sleek and graceful as a fish. He swam long, languid strokes and came back, looking happier than Remus had seen him in a long time. Afterwards, wrapped in towels, the girls showed the pure-blood boys how to build a sandcastle without any magic, and James and Peter became extremely invested in creating a complicated irrigation system to ensure that the moat was properly supplied at all times. Back at the tents, they cooked dinner. Thankfully, Marlene and Dorcas offered to supervise this, frying bacon over a little gas burner Lily's father had donated. James and Lily went off to the shop, ostensibly for milk, and returned with a case of cider. Muggle drinks too? Sirius exclaimed. We're getting a fully rounded experience, apparently, James laughed. Lily giggled, then blushed and looked away. Remus could already see where this evening was heading, and he sat himself as far away from Sirius as possible. They'd already agree that James and Sirius would share one tent, with Peter and Remus in the other, so at least there would be no awkwardness there. He just had to watch his drinking. Mary had lit a fire using magic while Lily had gone, No one tell her, all right? I'm not about to sit here freezing my snatch off while Potter and Black piss about rubbing sticks together. And Marlene had brought a wireless radio, so once the cans of cider had been passed round, it was a very cosy scene indeed. How long have you two been going out? Dorcas asked Lily and James. They leapt apart, looking at each other guiltily. We're not! Lily squeaked, moving to sit next to Remus as if to prove it. Mary and Marlene exchanged a look, and Sirius shot a confused glance at James. Oh, sorry, Dorcas smiled oblivious. I just thought, but Sirius and Mary, you used to go out, right? For my sins, Mary squawked, laughing. Sirius poked out his tongue at her. Marlene, who'd been reading a guidebook she bought in the visitor's information centre, cleared her throat loudly. There's a castle ruin that far from here. We could go tomorrow which swiftly changed the subject to plans for the rest of the week. Camping holidays seemed to involve a lot of walking, Remus realised. He'd hoped his hip would be up to it. A few tins in, and they were all in a very silly mood. The drink was flat and clear, which Remus knew was a dangerous sign when it came to cider. They'd all have skull-splitting headaches in the morning if they weren't careful. He didn't bring it up, though. Everyone was so happy. Why spoil it, worrying about consequences? Dorcas was lying back on Peter's chest, using him as an armchair, humming softly to the music. He was trying to get his hand under her shirt and thought he was being discreet. Mary and Marlene were whispering to each other, bursting into giggles every now and then. James and Sirius were throwing stones into the fire. It was obviously a competition of sorts, but Remus couldn't figure out what the rules were supposed to be. A familiar tune began to play on the radio. Mot the Hoople. It was a few years old now, but it had been a favourite at Gryffindor parties. Billy rapped all night about his suicide, how he'd kicked it in the head when he was 25. Speed, jive, don't want to stay alive when you're 25. Turn it up! Mary nudged Marlene, who flicked her wand at the wireless lazily, then cracked open another can. They all hushed to listen, nodding along and tapping their feet softly on the grass. When the chorus came, the girls all sang along in that soft, under-the-breath way that girls were so good at. All the young dudes carry the news. When the song finished, they cheered drunkenly, laughing amongst themselves. I bloody love you lot, Marlene slurred. You're all my best friends. Same to you, McKinnon, Sirius grinned across the flames, raising his can. She waggled a drunken finger at him dopily. I know your game, Black. I'll have you know, you're not my type. Everyone laughed at that, even Sirius. When are we going to find you a nice girl, Remus? 
Lily said thoughtfully, squeezing up to him for warmth and laying her head on his shoulder. He smiled wanly, putting an affectionate arm around her. Yeah, you deserve a bit of fun, Mooney, James winked at him. Remus avoided Sirius's sudden glare by taking another swig from his can. I've had plenty of fun with you lot, he said. Have you ever had a girlfriend, Remus? Dorcas asked. She didn't mean anything by it. She didn't know them very well. But there was an awkward hush all the same. Or maybe Remus was the only one who noticed. He glanced up at Mary coyly and smiled. Nah, he said. Aw, Dorcas said very tipsy. How come? Suddenly it dawned on Remus. Marlene was right. He loved these people. Every one of them. What was the point keeping secrets from them? This wasn't up to Sirius. This wasn't up to anyone but him. He breathed in and looked at the fire again. I'm gay, he said. Peter choked on his drink. Out of the corner of his eye, Remus saw James run his hands through his hair, sit up straighter. He saw Mary's mouth fall open and heard Marlene give out a surprised hiccup. He dared not look at Sirius. His stomach turned and he prepared to get up, to walk away and apparate somewhere, anywhere. But then Lily raised her head. She kissed his cheek and hugged him tighter before settling back down against his shoulder. You still deserve some fun, she said decisively. Chapter 115 Summer, 1977 Part 2 Sweet, handsome friend, I can tell you truly that I've never been without desire, since it pleased you that I have you as my lover. Nor did a time ever arrive, sweet handsome friend, when I didn't want to see you often, nor did I ever feel regret, nor did it ever come to pass, if you went off angry, that I felt joy until you'd come back, nor ever. Tibor de Sarnom Two hours later. Peter and Dorcas were snogging, rolling backwards onto the grass. Everyone was drunk, but they were probably the drunkest. Go back to your tent if you're going to do that. James threw an empty cider can at them. Do you mind, Mooney? Peter surfaced, red in the face and bleary-eyed. If we go back to yours, you can bunk in with prongs and padfoot, can't you? Oh, don't worry. Remus waved a hand. I'll find somewhere. Sirius still hadn't looked at him, and he had a feeling that after the night's revelations he would not be particularly welcome. Peter and Dorcas disappeared. There was muffled giggling from within the tent, then the ghostly hollow quiet of a silencing charm. Share with us if you want, Remus, Mary said, getting up to leave for her own tent. Lily nodded. Yeah, our tent is much bigger. Come in with us. Thanks, girls. He smiled. He was really grateful. You go on. I'm not tired yet. I think I'll just go for a walk. He got up, limbs stiff and aching, and headed for the sea. It was probably dark now away from the fire, but Remus had always been able to see in the dark. The tide was in and louder than ever. A cold breeze flew forth and he fumbled in his back pocket for a cigarette. He lit up and inhaled deeply, closing his eyes, feeling that now he could really think. He was glad he said it no matter what the reaction, but he still considered leaving. Okay, so they weren't all about to kick his head in, but who knew how they'd all act in the cold light of morning, stark and sober? Was it better or worse than being a werewolf? He could still apparate if he wanted to. Go and look for Grant, maybe. Remus felt a surge of guilt. He hadn't thought about Grant in a while, maybe not all year. The other boy had been so kind to him, taking him in and willing to put him up indefinitely. He'd given Remus some excellent advice, too, if only Remus had taken it. Stay away from posh boys. All right, Mooney, James approached him. Remus turned. Sirius was with him, looking sheepish. It looked as though James had dragged him over against his will. Remus wasn't surprised. All right, he nodded. He offered James a cigarette. James shook his head no. Just wanted to see you were okay. Fine, thanks. Good. Sorry if I made things awkward. 
You didn't, James said a little too eagerly, as if he'd been hoping Remus would bring it up first. Sirius winced, but only Remus noticed. Honestly, mate, we're glad you told us, really. Remus just nodded and looked back at the sea, taking another drag on his cigarette. Behind him, he heard James nudging Sirius, obviously trying to get him to say something reassuring and friendly, but to no avail. James spoke again. Don't run off, okay, Mooney? Remus turned back, raising an eyebrow. James was grinning. Yeah, we know what you like. Stay, okay? Everything's fine. Even Pete wasn't that bothered. Pete, Remus snorted. He's too busy trying to get his end anyway. Can't blame him, James laughed. He touched Remus's shoulder. Do you want to talk about it? Remus shook his head, looking down. He stubbed out his cigarette and immediately lit another. Sirius wanted one, he could tell, but Remus was feeling belligerent, and unless Black asked, like a normal human being, he wasn't going to get one. Thanks, James, Remus said pointedly, exhaling smoke. You're a real mate. Still marauders, James smiled tiredly. He yawned. I think I'm going to turn in. Coming. I'm going to have another one after this, Remus raised his second cigarette. I'll have one too, Sirius said gruffly. James nodded, stifling another yawn, and turned away. Don't come back sinking a fag ash, you two, he threw over his shoulder as he walked back toward the campfire on the turf. Remus returned his gaze to the sea, but handed Sirius the box. He heard him withdraw a cigarette, light up, inhale. He waited for it. Why'd you say that? Sirius said. Remus closed his eyes and smiled softly. He didn't want to fight, but he was ready for one. He was always ready. Wanted to. I just had to know what they'd think, one way or another. It's like you've just gone and changed everything round on me. He didn't sound accusatory. He sounded hurt. Didn't mean to, Remus said. Were you expecting me to say something, too? No, I wasn't expecting anything, Remus snapped. It wasn't anything to do with you, actually. Oh, okay. Sirius raised his hands in surrender, still looking uncomfortable. Just, I thought you might have told me first, that's all, given the situation... This caught Remus entirely off guard, and he finally looked at Sirius. You mean you didn't already know? How could you not know? You said you weren't, Sirius shrugged. Like I said, I wasn't. Thought we were on the same page, that's all. Remus found his anger returning. Typical Sirius, never thinking about anything more than his own personal gratification, never once considering that anyone else had feelings or thoughts. Obviously we weren't, he said coldly. Anyway, I don't see how it matters now. If that's all you're worried about, then don't. You're safe, Remus said stonily. I'm not going to tell anyone about you and me, and I doubt anyone suspects you, what with your considerable history with girls. I don't see why you care so much that I tell people. I do care, Sirius protested. Remus closed his eyes. A few months ago, this would have sounded wonderful. God, he was so tired. Remus! Sirius sounded half annoyed, half frightened. I can care about you and, you know, not scream it from the rooftops. Wanting to get off with me isn't the same as caring. Remus, fucking hell, just because I'm not... I haven't got whatever you've got yet, doesn't mean I ha don't have the same... Ah, fuck's sake! Sirius cursed at his own inarticulacy. And all the girls? Remus tutted. That's... that's different. Okay. Remus sighed. His voice was empty. He was willing to leave it there. Sirius wasn't. You don't understand. Remus didn't say anything. He didn't see what he had to understand. He just had to be the stronger one. Sirius continued, a hand on Remus's arm. When I think about myself with them, I can just see it, you know? I know how it's going to play out. I know what I'm supposed to do. When I think about me and you, 
You know, the real me and you. I just... I can't see how it ends. I try not to think about it. So, I know I was a bit of a dick. I could have handled it better. But I swear, I didn't want it to end like that. His breathing was shallow now. Remus could hear his heart rate increasing by the second. I didn't want it to end at all, to be honest. Remus nodded. He pushed Sirius's hand away, gently, looking out at the sea. He knew Sirius was staring at him, but he kept facing forward. Look, Sirius, I don't mean to be cruel. I do understand all that. He really did. Hadn't he been over it all in his own head? I know it's not easy for you. Sirius made a noise of relief at that, seemed to relax slightly. Maybe they were getting somewhere for once. Remus pushed on. But it is easy for me. I'm queer, all right? I know when we started I said I wasn't, and... Well, I shouldn't have said that because I am. And I'm not saying you're queer too, or you have to be, or anything. But I couldn't carry on the way we were without you just, I don't know, acknowledging it. Sirius was watching him very closely as he said this, thinking hard. Remus knew how he looked when he was thinking, when he was working a problem through. It wasn't mischievous or cheeky or sarcastic. It was deeply solemn and serious. It was really bloody sexy, actually, but Remus tried to ignore that bit. Finally done thinking, Sirius gave a short nod. Okay, then, he said simply. What? Remus frowned. Fucking acknowledged. Message received. Sirius stubbed out his cigarette in the wet sand. So, what? Remus gaped. We just leave things as they are? Sirius scratched behind his ear, looking down, a strange, shy gesture. I'd rather not. You'd rather not, Remus repeated, dumbfounded. No. I mean, if you want me to go round telling everyone I know, then sorry, but we're not all as ballsy as you. I need more time, but I could try. You could try. This was not the outcome Remus had expected when the conversation began. What do you mean? Sirius cut him off, placing a palm on Remus's cheek to turn it toward him and kissing him gently on the lips. I mean, I'll try, he said as he pulled away. I miss you, Mooney. Oh, you would go and say something like that. Remus grabbed him and pulled him back. It was like water after a drought, shelter in a storm. They were the still point of the turning world and every other stupid sloppy cliché you could think of. They kissed for a long time and when they came apart they were practically gasping with relief. No more girls? Remus asked, still holding Sirius in place as if he might run away. No more girls, Sirius agreed. Let's see how this pans out first. Ah, oh, charming. Remus let go, satisfied. Shut up. Sirius nudged him with his shoulder, hands deep in his pockets. Come on, let's go back to the tent, eh? I'm freezing. They walked back toward the tents and the dying fire with their backs to the wind. I think I'm drunk, Remus said shakily. He felt all stirred up. I make bad decisions when I'm drunk. Sirius laughed and squeezed his shoulder quickly. I know. I'm promising you this isn't one of them. Okay. I'm trusting you. Unfortunately, they found out that none of the tents were available anymore. The tent Remus had been sharing with Pete was well and duly occupied by the sounds of it. Sirius grimaced and cast a fresh silencing spell over the flagging one. Amateurs, he muttered. There was a silencing spell cast over James and Sirius's tent too. Mary poked her hand out of the next one along, giggling. It's James and Lily! Are you serious? Sirius gaped. Bloody hell, I mean... Wow, I kind of want to go in there and shake his hand. I have a feeling his hands are busy, Remus raised an eyebrow. Want to go in with me, Remus? Mary asked tipsily. What about Sirius? All right, fine. Ugh! I'll get in with Marles. Night, lads. She crawled across the grass into Marlene's tent. Sirius and Remus looked at each other for a few moments before Sirius climbed in first. 
The girls' tent was much more comfortable than theirs, stuffed with blankets and pillows and a plump blow-up mattress. Knew we should have got the Muggleborns to sort us out, Sirius grumbled as he settled in. The mattress was old and sank slightly in the middle, rolling them together in an almost comical way. In the end, the only way to get comfortable was to curl up like spoons. This okay? Remus asked as he slipped an arm round Sirius's waist. Of course, Sirius replied. We could just sleep sonoro quiesis. Ah, okay. Well, it had been a while. Afterwards, Remus felt more awake than he ever had in his life. His brain was buzzing with questions, declarations, thoughts, words. It felt like coming out of hiding, like pulling back a disguise he'd worn for so long. He wanted to bear every bit of himself to Sirius. He wanted Sirius to see him. Sirius? Hmm. There's something else I need to tell you. Oh, Merlin, Sirius groaned, rolling onto his back sleepily. What now? I'm, um... Well, I'm homeless. What? Sirius opened his eyes and turned round at once. What? Since I turned seventeen, you know I'm of age now, so... So they just chucked you out? Remus nodded, glad to share the problem. Yeah, so when Hogwarts finishes next summer, I've got nowhere to go... Bastards! Sirius said angrily. He looked at Remus very seriously. You can stay with me and James at the Potters. They won't mind. I know they won't. Then, when school's finished, we'll find our own place. We will? Remus raised his eyebrows. Yeah, Sirius replied happily, folding his arms behind his head. It'll be just like school. You, me, James and Pete. All together. Oh, Remus realised what he'd meant. Yeah, sounds great. I've a bit of money Lyle left me. Sirius replied. I've got enough money for all of us. Don't worry about that. Okay, Remus said. I won't worry. Go to sleep, Sirius said. We'll be knackered tomorrow. Okay, Remus repeated, closing his eyes. Chapter 116 Summer 1977 Part 3 Remus woke up and stretched beneath bright canvas, Sirius breathing lightly behind him. It was a bit too warm and sticky, but he wouldn't have moved for anything. Lying peacefully under the blankets, he could still taste the salt on Sirius's skin, feel his heartbeat. At the bottom of the sleeping bag, their feet were tangled together. Sirius stirred, screwing up his face before he opened his eyes. Morning. Morning. Fuck me, my mouth is dry. Yeah, mine too, Remus agreed, running his tongue over his teeth. All that cider. I could go and get some water from the pump. Yeah, we'll both go. Reckon anyone else is up? Remus listened carefully, then shook his head. He hoped Sirius wasn't worried about getting caught. Surely no one would question their sharing a tent. What else could they have done? It was probably a bit too early to start interrogating Sirius, so Remus held his tongue as they dressed quietly and quickly, fishing out in the bottom of the bed for their clothes, which seemed to have scattered in the night. Clambering out and blinking hard against the bright daylight, Remus thought that everything seemed to look different. The same, but not quite as he remembered it before. More realistic, solid and anchored down. They sauntered off in the direction of the water pump with their canteens, and as they walked, they fell into step, and Remus felt as though his heart would burst with joy. Stupid, really, such a small thing. The campsite was lovely and peaceful, sparrows darting between the trees overhead and the occasional camper popping their head out and wishing a polite good morning to the boys as they passed. The water pump was by the shower block and they both ducked in to wash their faces quickly before filling their canteens, as well as the others they'd brought. Shop sells pasties, Sirius said thoughtfully, nodding in the direction of a little wooden hut with a blue and white striped awning. Shall we get some for breakfast, return to the camp as heroes? Good idea, Remus smiled shyly. They bought far too many Cornish pasties, but they were fresh out of the oven, flaky and buttery and warm, and Sirius had no impulse control. Back at the tent, no one had stirred yet, apparently, so Remus and Sirius decided they would take their breakfast on the beach. They sat on a sand dune, side by side, munching peacefully and licking the grease from their fingers afterwards. 
I could get used to this, Sirius said with a grin, rubbing his hands on his jeans, sighing happily at the view. The sand had been washed clean overnight by the tide. Everything was perfect and unblemished. Never been on a proper holiday before. Me neither. Remus wiped his own hands on his corduroy trousers and picked restlessly at the grass. Oi, Sirius said. What's up, Mooney? We said no worrying. Sorry. What's up? I was just wondering something. It's stupid, don't worry. They were quiet again. Remus fidgeted some more. He sighed. Why me? he asked quietly. Hmm? Why me, in the first place? We're not James, or literally everyone else. Anyone else. Is it just because... Is it because I let you? Path of least resistance? Obviously not, Sirius scoffed, frowning. What do you mean, why not James? I don't fancy James. You... Oh... I think we can at least admit we fancy each other. Sirius raised an eyebrow, thumbing Remus's hip through the thin fabric of his t-shirt. Remus nodded. Yeah, I just thought... I don't know. We never touched... much. What? Before all the shagging, Sirius said matter-of-factly. I used to wrestle with James all the time, and we'd share a bed sometimes and everything. Not you. You kept yourself separate. No touching. I was... shy. It got me really curious, I suppose. One Christmas, remember when Andromeda came to the Potters? I was really nervy. Convinced my mother was coming to get me every five minutes. I jumped whenever the door went. I remember, Remus said softly. Third year. Well, the door went and I was bricking it. We were on the landing, I think. You sort of squeezed my shoulder and... Well, it felt really nice. It meant more because it was you. I felt like you'd, I don't know, chosen me or something. I couldn't get you out of my head for weeks. We were fourteen. So? You and Mary started going out not long after that. Yeah, look how that turned out. Sirius huffed a laugh. Remus laughed too, despite himself. Then on your birthday... Sirius said, his voice faltering a bit, as if it were a difficult thing for him to talk about. You... you kissed me. I did, Remus replied steadily. Sorry. I didn't expect it, it was so out of the blue. I'd been thinking about you before that, but I didn't really know. I didn't know I was thinking about that. Then I thought, maybe it was my fault, like I'd given off some sort of message... Like I tricked you into something. What? No, trust me, I very much wanted to kiss you. Oh, good. Because I just felt so awful about it, you know. It was your first kiss and I went and mucked it all up. Uh, Remus sighed. Look, while we're being honest, you might as well know it was not my first kiss. What? Yeah, the summer before I sort of met someone. I never told any of you. I didn't... I didn't want you to know I was queer. That boy, Sirius said suddenly, and the muggle squat in Mile End. His name is Grant, Remus explained. Well, I hate him, Remus laughed. That's okay, he's so nice he won't even mind. I hate him even more. I ought to try and see him this summer. He's been so good to me, you don't even know the half of it. I'll go with you if you want. Thanks. That's kind. Mooney, Sirius said quietly. Hmm. I'm really sorry about everything. It's okay. It's not. It is. It's not. Sirius, for fuck's sake, you can't even apologize without starting a fight. I'm telling you, it's okay. I was being unfair. I think... I think I was asking you for something I don't even understand properly myself. Loyalty or love or whatever. I do love you, Mooney. I love all of you. You, James, Peter. Yeah, Remus sighed. He closed his eyes as if to reset the conversation. 
When he opened them again, Sirius looked anxious. Remus smiled reassuringly. Looking forward to seventh year? Dunno. Bit scary, isn't it? You mean the war? The war, Sirius agreed. Other stuff too. Last year before we have to grow up. Remus laughed softly. I don't think you'll ever grow up, Padfoot. I've been so selfish. Sirius had turned melancholy again. I said it's fine. It's not, though. His brow creased slightly as he searched for the words he needed. Remus held his breath, not sure what was coming, but somehow knowing he needed to hear it. You have so many secrets, and it must be so shit keeping things back, Sirius began, gaining momentum the more he spoke. And I made it worse. I just gave you more things to hide. I've loved keeping your secret, Remus wanted to say. I'd keep a thousand more for you. He knew that this line of thinking could only make things worse, so he said nothing. Sirius risked reaching out, grasping Remus's hand and holding it. Remus squeezed back. It's not that I'm ashamed of you or this. It's a million other things. I wish I could tell everyone. I wish I was ready. I will be, Mooney. I promise. Sirius looked at him, full of pleading. Remus forgave him wholeheartedly. It wasn't difficult to meet his eyes any more. James seemed uh, pretty okay with me being queer, Remus prompted quietly. He felt a bit underhanded bringing up James. James belonged to Sirius. It wasn't Remus's business to interfere. Of course he was, the beautiful bastard, Sirius snorted. Fucking prince among men, isn't he? I know. I know he'd probably even be fine with this. He gripped Remus's fingers. But he's my best friend, and I just don't want to change that yet. I wouldn't want to be alone with him and have him wondering, even if he wasn't thinking about it. I would be. Okay, Remus said. He was agreeing to everything. He knew it was stupid, but it was so easy now. Morning, lads! Mary called from the campsite. Sirius pulled his hand back quickly, giving Remus an apologetic glance. Cheers for the pasties! They both turned around and waved at her. Sirius got up, extending an arm to help Remus to his feet. Come on, he said, eyes twinkling. I can't wait to rip the shit out of Prongs for finally getting his leg over. Not in front of Lily, Remus cautioned. She'll curse your knob off. Well, we can't have that. I'm very attached to my knob. Sirius? Remus? This isn't just for the summer, is it? Sirius looked at him and grinned. I bloody hope not. Fortunately, no one was much interested in whatever Sirius and Remus had been up to the night before, because everyone else's night had been just as eventful. Peter gave him a bit of a wary look, but that might have been the hangover. Mary was grinning at everyone like the cat who'd got the cream, picking at her pasty and trying to catch Lily's eye. Marlene was bundled up in blankets, looking very green round the gills and giving out the occasional moan. All right, Miles? Remus asked gently. Mm. Poor love, Mary tuttered, patting her friend's blonde head gently. Went a bit hard on the old Rosie, didn't ya? Still could be worse. Dorcas hasn't come back from the loos yet. James and Lily were sitting next to each other, but not too close. Lily had scraped her hair back in a pigtail and was consciously staring at the ground, eating a pasty with a kind of quiet resignation. James looked absolutely chuffed, but was trying not to show it too much. So, Mary grinned widely, looking around at everyone. We'll stick with the new sleeping arrangements for the rest of the week then, shall we? Suits me, Sirius said casually. And me... Peter nodded, mouthful of mints. Marlene gave a silent, queasy thumbs up. James and Lily looked at each other, then looked away. Once everyone had finished eating, the girls arranged an expedition to the shower block. The boys followed after, towels under their arms, and Sirius teased James mercilessly. No, go away, I'm not telling you anything, James laughed. This is purely for academic purposes, Sirius chided. It's going to be a matter of historical interest, 
future generations will want to know what miraculous feats you had to perform in order to finally convince Evans to... We just talked. Oh, so the silencing spell was for... James turned bright red and disappeared inside a shower cubicle. Sirius chucked triumphantly. Doesn't anyone want to know about me and Dorcas? Peter said innocently. The castle ruins were about five miles' walk, which no one seemed to think was too far at all. Marlene had perked up a bit after showering and eating, and everyone decided the fresh air was probably the best cure for a hangover. They zipped up their tents, stuffing valuables into rucksacks, along with some leftover pasties and bottles of water, and set out round eleven. They followed a footpath along the shoreline, which curled round and gradually steepened into a cliff. The view at the top was breathtaking, but Remus was struggling to enjoy it much. His eyes watered and his legs burned with the effort of climbing uphill. Sirius, Mary and Marlene had raced to the top, Marlene coming first despite her queasiness. James surprised Remus by slowing down to match his own shambling crawl. All right there, Mooney, he asked cheerfully. Brilliant, Remus panted, not sure if he was pulling off sarcasm or just sounded like a terrible liar. We're in no rush, take it easy. Hmm. Padfoot wasn't too much of a tosser last night, was he? About the whole, um, about the stuff you told us? Remus shook his head, focusing on breathing in the horrible grind-click noise that had started happening in his hip every time he stepped forward. Good, James nodded, relieved. I just worried he might be... Well, you know what his family is like about that kind of thing. Was in two minds about leaving him alone with you, to be honest, but I thought you'd just give him a thump if he got out of order. Everything's fine, Remus wheezed. Don't worry. Good, James said again and stopped, because Remus had, just for a moment. The other six had crested the hill by now and were disappearing down the other side. They'd only been walking for twenty minutes, Remus thought grimly. He wondered if he could apparate ahead, but the deliberation part would be hard without a map or having seen the place before. He was embarrassed having James stay back with him, but at least it wasn't one of the girls. Sorry, he said, wiping sweat from his brow. Usually not this bad so far away from the moon. It's fine, James shrugged. We're on holiday, not a route march. Don't you want to catch up with Lily? I'll be fine. Giving her a bit of space. I think she's embarrassed. She really likes you, though, Remus said encouragingly. She told me. I know. James smiled, getting that dopey, dreamy look as he started over the cliff top. Can't believe my bloody luck. He cleared his throat. But it was just talking, all right? That's the party line. Don't say anything to Black. Remus laughed, straightening up. I won't. They began to walk again steadily. The sun was reaching its highest point, blazing above them so that they had to squint or look at their feet. We talked about you, actually, James said. Well, Lily did. I listened. Who? Oh? Yeah, no nothing horrible, I promise. I think it was probably just the cider and we were both rambling about how you were such a good mate. And then she said something about being brave and making your feelings known and living honestly. Or, I, I don't know, I was too busy being amazed she was even talking to me. Rima smiled at James and wanted to hug him on Lily's behalf. They reached the castle two hours later, a good half an hour behind the rest of the group, who'd waited for them. Sorry, Sirius said once they were out of earshot of the others. I didn't think. I'm fine, Remus smiled, trying to hide his exhaustion. I had prongs. There's a local bus that goes back to the campsite. I checked, Sirius said gallantly. We can get that back if you want. I'm fine. The castle was a ruin, beautiful grey stone in the summer sunshine, cast against the glistening sea hundreds of feet below. Remus could barely believe anyone had really lived there. The narrow spiral staircases had crumbled and led nowhere. Long grass and bright yellow dandelions had invaded what once might have been a great feasting hall. There were narrow slits in the remaining walls and graffiti carved into the parapets, where no doubt some bored soldier had once waited a thousand years ago. Perhaps he hadn't been much older than they were. War never changed. James, Peter and Sirius began a very enthusiastic sword fight with some stray sticks they'd found, while Remus sat rolling up cigarettes on a pile of rocks, watching them. 
You'd feel a lot fitter if you didn't fill your lungs with that shit, Marlene tutted. Here for a good time, not a long time, Miles, he replied dryly, licking up the adhesive strip on his paper and sticking it down carefully. He made four or five just to pass the time, tucking them neatly into an old matchbox he'd saved for the purpose. He watched Sirius playing the knight against Peter's dragon and laughed as James captured Lily, apparently now a princess, hoisting her effortlessly over his shoulder and running for the castle gates. She laughed and beat her fists against his back playfully, and when he put her down, she looked so happy in his arms. Eventually, some of the other tourists started to get a bit annoyed with the eight teenagers mucking about, so they decided it was time to go back down to the beach and spend rest of the afternoon cooling off in the sea. Lily and James led the group this time, hand in hand, chattering happily as if they'd been this intimate for years. A pang of envy shot through Remus. Not that he wanted to hold Sirius's hand. For one thing, it was much too hot. For another, you couldn't keep Sirius still long enough. You lot go ahead, Sirius called. Me and Mooney are having a fag break. Marlene tutted once more, but hurried to catch up with the others. Remus and Sirius sat on a stone wall for a bit, smoking. There's a pub down there, Sirius nodded further up the lane. Saw it on the way up. It's got a garden. Want to go there and waste some time? Yeah, Remus said, surprised. That sounded ideal. But don't you want to catch up with James? James doesn't love me anymore, Sirius sighed dramatically, holding his wrist against his forehead like an old woman about to faint. His heart has been claimed by another. Remus laughed, then dared to say, Oh well, you've got me. I've got you, Sirius nodded with a grin, hopping down from the wall. Come on then, could murder a pint. The pub was a small whitewashed cottage with mustard yellow shutters, a red tile roof, and a neat row of red geraniums planted in pots outside. Inside was dark, musty, and cavernous. Remus had to duck under the low ceiling. The gruff working men propping up the bar all turned to look as they entered, and for a moment Remus wondered if it had been a bad idea after all. Still, Sirius ordered two pints of lager and they took them outside to the garden, sitting on a table underneath a beech tree for shade. As they headed out, the surly barmen and unfriendly locals turned back to their own drinks, obviously deciding to ignore the two boys. Remus was sure he heard one of them mutter, Bloody toffs, which he took as a personal slight, though of course it could have been much worse. Still, they were alone in the garden and had the privacy they'd been seeking. Sirius was impervious to the attitude of others. Maybe he didn't notice. Maybe he just didn't think muggles were worth worrying about. It's great here he said, gulping down his foggy warm beer. Do you think we could live here when it's all over? I like London, Remus replied. It's what I'm used to. Remember you promised we could go to Carnaby Street, Sirius said, playing with Remus's matchbox. This summer, I'm holding you to it. When did I say that? Christmas. Oh, right. Okay, we'll go. I can't believe you forgot. Well, you spent half of Christmas trying to convince me to get a girlfriend, so... Ugh. Sirius groaned, apparently in shame. Sorry. I thought it might help me, um, feel less attached to you. Sounds a bit bonkers now that I think about it. Now it sounds bonkers. Remus kicked him under the table. Logical thought processes are not my forte, Mr. Mooney. Sirius laughed with an aristocratic turn of his head. You ought to make your peace with it if we're going to, um, if we're going to start going out, Remus prompted gently. Sirius gave him an apologetic smile. Going out, yeah, he agreed. Sorry. You'll get there, Remus said casually, gulping his pint. And with that, the ice was broken and they began to talk and talk. It was that easy. After months of failure to communicate, it seemed that the gates had now been flung wide open. They found that once they'd begun, they couldn't stop. Remus would relate some assumption he'd made, some belief he'd had about an interaction long ago, and what he'd thought it meant at the time. And Sirius would shake his head with wide, earnest eyes and say, But Mooney, it wasn't like that at all! When it came down to brass tacks, Remus discovered that much of his misery was his own making that most of the time Sirius had never meant harm, and often hadn't even known he was causing Remus any pain at all. 
It was just his own bungled idea of what was going on. They even talked about Mary. I really did like her, he said. I think that's what threw me off in the beginning. You know, it wasn't like girls weren't doing it for me in that department. And she was so confident. I just thought you were with her because you didn't want to be with me. No, Sirius said firmly. That's a horrible thought. It was for her, not for you. He looked at him. Sorry. No, <sighs> don't be. That makes me feel better, actually. Anyway, Sirius smirked. What about you and Mary? Oh, God. Remus buried his face in his hands. Don't, I'm so embarrassed. It's fine. I liked it. Sirius raised an eyebrow, giving Remus a look so sultry it would probably get him arrested in some parts of the country. I noticed, he blushed. Didn't help you feel less attached then? Obviously not. I couldn't believe you didn't mind that, and yet when you found out about Chris... Sirius straightened up, looking annoyed. Him. There's nothing between us. We're just friends. And this other bloke, Grant, was he... Sirius shifted, obviously uncomfortable, as he struggled to get the word out. Your boyfriend? Not really, Remus replied easily. It's hard to explain. He's a friend. I care about him as much as I do you and James and Peter and the girls. More secrets, Remus. Sirius ran his hands through his hair, frustrated. I can't keep track. I don't know how you do it. Can you stop hiding stuff? From me, at least? I don't know how, Remus said quietly. It'll be hard. But you can try? Sirius smiled. Remus chuckled and nodded. They finished their drinks and decided to head back to the campsite. I'll teach you to swim, Sirius offered. Fuck off, you will, Remus snorted. Is there anything else you've been keeping secret, eh, Remu? Sirius nudged him as they meandered slowly downhill. It was much easier the way back, but they were going very slowly anyway. Nope, Remus laughed. He felt light as air. It was like being high, having nothing to hide at all. Queer, illiterate, homeless, werewolf. He ticked them off on his fingers. I think that's it. Oh, and my mum. Your mum? I got a letter in that box of depressing stuff from Dumbledore. Photos and a letter. An apology. Oh, blimey, okay, what did it... No, I don't want to talk about it yet, sorry. Fine, Sirius shrugged. Let's say we can talk about anything at all, except our mothers. Perfect, Remus nodded. Chapter 117 Summer 1977 Part 4 Content warning for themes of homophobia in this chapter. The rest of the week in Cornwall passed in complete bliss as far as Remus and Sirius were concerned. They spent long hot days on the beach and hillsides, wandering through quaint little villages, exploring caves and getting tipsy in pub gardens. They dined exclusively on pasties, fish and chips and ice cream, and at night, oh, the nights were the best of all. During the day, if the others were around, they would toss a ball back and forth across the sand, or Remus would consent to paddle in the sea a little, jeans rolled up and long sleeve shirt still firmly on. If it was just the two of them, then he might roll the sleeves up to his elbows, exposing old scars, and Sirius would become padfoot and chase sticks or his own tail, and they often got to be alone because everyone else seemed to want to keep sneaking off. James and Lily were the worst. When they weren't bickering, they were snogging, gratuitously and at length. You're supposed to be prefects, Mary yelled at them after the third night, finding them practically horizontal in front of the campfire. Oh, as if I haven't caught you a hundred times on my rounds, Lily laughed, getting up and straightening her clothes nonetheless. And you, Black, so you can stop leering. What? Sirius blinked innocently. He was carrying back the bowl of washing up from the shower block. Remus had been pretty amazed by that. Sirius had volunteered to do the dishes every night so far. I quite like doing it the muggle way, he'd confided secretly. Mother used to make us do the house elves' work as a punishment sometimes, but I just found it to be raxing, to be honest. Don't draw me into your sordid escapades, 
Sirius was saying prudishly, setting down the tub. I've been a perfect gentleman all holiday. I'm not convinced you haven't been sneaking off with some muggle girl in the village, Marlene said. She was lying stretched out on a towel in her underwear, sunbathing. Her body was very long and very pale. How dare you! Sirius flicked her with the damp tea towel, making her yelp and crease up. I've been tucked in bed early every night, haven't I, Mooney? Remus choked on the crackers he'd been nibbling on and had to be slapped on the back by James a few times before he recovered. You'll pay for that later, Black, he glared at Sirius, eyes watering. Once James had calmed down about the Lily Evans event, as Sirius was calling it behind his back, enough to think straight, he'd been surprised that Sirius and Remus were now sharing a tent and suspicious for all the wrong reason. You're not going to start fighting again, you two. You know you only wind each other up in close proximity. Right you are, Prongs, Sirius said brightly. You bunk in with Mooney and I'll share with Evans. That put an end to that line of questioning, but not to James's sudden overprotectiveness of Remus. It was nice, certainly nothing to whinge about, but a bit uncomfortable. Remus had never had any kind of big brother figure, unless you counted Craig, who'd taught him to steal and drink and throw a proper punch, but James now seemed determined to do his clumsy, kind-hearted best. Midway through the week, Remus was a little surprised that no one had so much as mentioned the confession he'd made on the first night. Not that he wanted anyone to make a fuss or say anything sly or backhanded, but still, nothing at all. He brought it up with Sirius in a quiet moment and he laughed. Well, if Prongs gave everyone else the bloody speech, I'm not surprised. Speech? Yeah, he pulled me aside and told me if I started treating you any differently, he'd thump me. Probably didn't say that to the girls. Maybe Lily did them. Sirius stretched out doggishly, lying on his front. They were lounging on the beach alone, on a quiet stretch of sand which so far no one else had discovered. Sirius was in his swimming trunks, and Remus was taking the opportunity to stare at him as much as he liked, and as brazenly as he liked. Every now and then he gathered a handful of silky yellow sand and poured it over Sirius's skin, just to watch the grain slide like water over the muscles of his back. "'You're having me on,' Remus said lazily, not believing Sirius. "'Wish I was.' I swear it was so hard not to laugh in his face and just tell him everything. He rolled over, brushing the sand away carelessly. I'm going to go have a wash off in a minute if you keep doing that. That's the idea, Remus smirked. Sirius in the sea was his new favourite thing to look at. Remus still didn't really believe him, not until the very last day of the holiday. They were all trying to pack up the tents, which didn't seem to want to fit back into the bags they'd arrived in, and Remus had ended up taking over because Peter, Sirius, and James couldn't seem to understand the concept of instructions. The girls had deconstructed their own camp in less than an hour, and it was getting a bit shameful. Right, that peg needs to come out first, and there's a sort of top sheet we need to remove. Otherwise, everything gets tangled up, Remus said, scratching his head. Sirius did this successfully and began folding up the brown canvas. What will we do without you, Mooney? James chuckled. Yeah, Peter said from the ground where he was collecting pegs. Who'd have thought you'd be good at all this stuff? Well, I have always been the sensible one, Remus murmured, not really paying it any mind, skimming the next few steps in the leaflet. Then he realised it had gone quiet and James was standing over Peter. What do you mean, this stuff? Peter looked up, confused, and rubbed his hands together. You know, outdoorsy stuff, blokey stuff. I didn't mean... Pete, a word, James said, his voice weirdly hard and flat, channeling Euphemia Potter in a stern mood. He marched off toward the beach, Peter following nervously behind. Blokey stuff, Sirius muttered, though he looked anxious and pale too. What was all that about? Remus asked, going over to pick up the pegs that Peter had put down. Sirius shook his head and didn't speak again until Peter and James returned, Peter looking very shaken. Remus wished he could have said something, but he felt like he only might make the problem worse. When it came to say goodbye, nobody wanted to leave. Remus found himself staring glumly down at the four yellow squares of grass where the tents had been, while James and Lily clung to each other, saying their goodbyes. You going back to Essex, Remus? Mary asked cheerfully. Staying with the Potters for a bit, 
Remus replied, trying to perk up. Lucky, Mary said. I've got to go back to Croydon. Marlene invited me to stay, but Mum says she doesn't see enough of me as it is. That's nice, Remus smiled. It's nice to be missed. Peter and Dorcas left first, heading up the main road to find a secluded spot to hail the night bus. Remus waved them off and everything seemed fine, but that might just have been James's presence. The girls apparated, once Lily finally let go of James, promising to visit before the summer was over, promising to write, making James promise to telephone. She hugged Remus and then, perhaps just in a moment of blind happiness, Sirius too. James, Remus, and Sirius apparated back to the Potters with somewhat more success than the first time. Remus ended up in the back garden somehow, Sirius somewhere in the village, but Mrs. Potter was thrilled to see them all the same and decided they all needed some proper food for once. "'Should we get in touch with the home for you, Remus?' Mr. Potter asked casually over dinner. "'You're not pulling another vanishing act, are you? Can't have the Muggle police called again?' "'Oh, uh, no, I, um...' Remus stammered over his boiled potatoes. What could he say to make them stop asking? What would buy a bit more time? Sirius kicked him under the table and gave him a look. Go on, Mooney, he said. Tell them the truth. Remus looked at Mr. Potter. Actually, now I'm seventeen, there isn't a place for me at St. Edmund's. Oh, good, Mrs. Potter smiled benignly. We've got you for the whole summer, then. Wonderful. As easy as that. I told you, Sirius whispered as he slid into Remus's bed after midnight. The Potters love taking in strays. Should you be here? Remus whispered back. What about James? Snoring his head off. I could hear him through the wall. Remus didn't press it further. After all, he wanted Sirius there. It felt funny lying alone in a big double bed after a week spent squished up in a tent. Having another body close by was comforting. Having Sirius's body close by was even better. Well done for telling them, Sirius said quietly, holding Remus's hand under the covers. He did that often and only in bed, in the dark. Remus didn't mind. Yeah, I'm just telling everyone everything this week, Remus laughed. Nothing wrong with asking for help, Mooney. People like helping their friends. I know. Remus kissed the top of Sirius's head one of the many privileges now permitted to him. Sirius liked to sleep hidden under the covers, like a hibernating creature. It made him seem smaller than he was, and made Remus feel protective. Another thing that was okay to feel, now. Sirius? Hmm? That thing Wormtail said, did it really upset you? He felt Sirius tense against him and instantly wished he hadn't brought it up. He tried to cover his tracks. Just... You know, Pete, he's a bit of an idiot sometimes, but he's just thick, not spiteful. He'll get used to it. Get used to me. Next time he needs his homework done, it won't matter. I've heard stuff like that before, that's all, Sirius said very low, so that Remus, who had usually perfect hearing, better than perfect, had to listen closely. About being a man. You know, that sort of thing. From your mother... Sirius didn't speak, but his head moved slightly and Remus took it for a nod. We aren't talking about mothers, Remus had to remind himself. He just squeezed Sirius's hand and said the only thing he could think of. Well, then you know it was all bollocks. Saturday, 30th of July, 1977. James Potter was not as clever as Remus had given him credit for. They'd been back from Cornwall for a fortnight, James had telephoned Lily from the phone box at the end of the road exactly 14 times, and exactly 14 times Remus had to accompany James to the phone box, put the coins in the slot, dial the number for him, and show him how to hang up at the end. The phone calls lasted for about an hour usually, leaving Sirius and Remus to sit outside the brick wall smoking. Occasionally they walked up and down the high street, but mostly they just waited for James to finish. Bloody idiot. Remus sighed as he exited the booth the fourteenth time. How hard is it to remember a few simple steps? He did muggle studies. Don't they explain this stuff? Oh, he gets too excited to remember anything, Sirius laughed. Have some sympathy for the lovesick fool. No, I will be joyless and miserable forever, Remus grumbled, fumbling for his cigarette lighter. Oh, good. I love it when you're all dark and moody. Fuck off. Oh, yeah, 
Now call me a stupid prat. That really gets me going. Sirius teased, cigarette between his teeth, embers glowing in his eyes. Remus shoved him so that he stumbled off the wall, laughing. You are a, you are being a stupid prat. Only for you. Sirius stubbed out his cigarette. There was a low, dark rumbling in the far distance, and Sirius's whole face lit up. He grabbed Remus's arm. Look, here it comes, right on time. Remus rolled his eyes. Sirius had another reason to indulge James. Every evening, while they waited for the lovebirds to finish their phone call, a miraculous thing happened, in Sirius's eyes anyway. A motorbike drove through the village, probably some ageing hippie on his way home from his boring commuter job, Remus thought petulantly. It was a Triumph Bonneville T120. Remus hated that he knew this, but after they'd seen it for the first time, Sirius had dragged him to the newsagents to buy every motorcyclist magazine he could find until they'd identified the model. With a cherry red tank, every inch of chrome polished to a gleaming silver. Sirius was madly in love. Remus was madly jealous. Once the bike had passed, Sirius gave a sigh of satisfaction, then climbed back onto the wall and watched Remus for a while. He did that a lot now. Remus had to learn not to mind too much, being scrutinised. Sirius cocked his head. Is it the moon, making you grumpy? Probably, Remus shrugged. Usually makes me restless. Yeah, I noticed. Last night, Sirius winked. Oh my god, shut up, obnoxious prick! Sirius grinned and poked out his sharp pink tongue. Remus was nervous about the moon. It would be his first full moon not spent at either Hogwarts or St. Edmund's, though presumably there'd been another full moon once long ago with his mother. Mr. Potter had taken him aside after it was agreed that Remus would be staying for the rest of the summer and explain their plan of action. Not that it mattered much to Remus. A locked room was a locked room. This time it was the attic, and Moody had offered to stand guard outside, ensuring that the family would be safe. Mr. and Mrs. Potter, not to mention James and Sirius, had repeatedly reassured Remus that they weren't concerned in the slightest and that he oughtn't to worry either. But of course he did anyway. Sirius wanted to go in with him, so did James, but James had at least enough common sense to realise it wouldn't be possible. No one was going to get anything past Moody, who had a new creepy eye, electric blue and horribly enchanted. "'Tackled werewolves before,' he said gruffly as Remus was led up the ladder to the attic. "'Always got a good result. Minimal casualties.' This did not make Remus feel better, but he wasn't sure if it was supposed to. It was a bad night. Maybe it was Moody's presence. Maybe the wolf didn't like heights. Maybe it could smell its usual playmates, Prongs and Padfoot, and felt lonely. Maybe the wolf just hated Remus. Who knew? Either way, when he woke, he found he'd ripped the room apart, torn at the blinds and scratched the floorboards. In the end, the wolf had chewed its own paws out of frustration. Hands bleeding, the skin all grazed away, Remus lay in the dark, his heart pounding, waiting for the pain to subside, or for someone to come and help him, whichever came first. Mrs. Potter patched him up and did a good job, but he still struggled to hold his wand for a few days while the skin grew back. He couldn't hold a broom handle either, so had to just watch while Peter, Sirius and James practiced, like old times. Remus found other ways to occupy himself. He got hold of a copy of a telephone book and spent more time than was probably healthy looking up every Jenkins in Bristol. There were lots of them, but no hopes. Hopeless. It didn't matter, he tried to tell himself. He got on all right for twelve years without her. Tell me a secret, Sirius would whisper late at night, every night he came to Remus. Tell me something no one knows. And Remus would tell him, because it made Sirius happy, and that was a very worthwhile pursuit. In fact, Remus was realising, making Sirius happy might be the only thing worth doing for the rest of his life. I'm the one who told Philomena Pettigrew to go to America. You never... Yep, in the bathroom on Christmas Eve. Sly bastard. How do you get girls falling all over you to talk to you, eh? What's your secret? Maybe they trust me because they know I'm not trying to get off with them. An intriguing thought. Tell me another secret. Um, I don't know. I've told you everything. Everything that wouldn't hurt you, he added silently. You haven't. Sirius said, his lips now against Remus's, as he crawled on top of him, hands sliding up Remus's nightshirt. 
He flicked his tongue along Remus's bottom lip. I'm going to know everything about you one day. I promise. Remus kissed him deeply, believing every word. Chapter 118 Summer 1977, Part 5 Monday, 19th of August, 1977 Remus awoke from his second full moon, slightly better off than his last, but unable to move. Moody had bound him to the bed, kept in the attic specifically for this purpose, using some kind of advanced magic. It didn't hurt, but it was pretty humiliating, having to lie there and wait to be released without any clothes on. Sirius had been vehemently against the idea, but it didn't hurt, and it was better than the alternative. Remus didn't care how the wolf felt about it. Made a lot of noise, Moody said as he released him. But that's to be expected. What do others do? Remus asked, pulling on his jeans quickly, wishing Moody would leave, or at least turn his back. The werewolves the Ministry knows about. Either deal with it at home like this, with an R checking in before and after, or report to the Ministry holding cells. I'll get you a leaflet if you want. No, thanks. Remus had the distinct impression that Moody did not approve of Remus's decision not to register himself. Downstairs in his normal bedroom, Mrs. Potter had laid out a set of robes on the bed for him. Not uniform robes, but normal everyday ones, the sort that James and Sirius wore out of school. He hoped they were hand-me-downs. He didn't know how he'd ever repay them if they started buying him clothes. They're for going out, James explained when Remus asked about it. Diagon Alley today. With the first day of school not far off, it had been agreed that the boys would stay in Diagon Alley for the first few days of the summer holidays. Mr. and Mrs. Potter would be leaving for a few weeks, on business for Dumbledore, evident, apparently, though they neither confirmed nor denied this. Even Moody could not argue with Remus going to Diagon Alley this time. Crawling with horrors these days. Undercover, you wouldn't even know it. And I'm seventeen, Remus said curtly, so I'm free to go where I please. Quite, Euphemia said tiredly. Their Hogwarts letters had arrived only a week ago, and to everyone's surprise, James had been named head boy, as evidenced by a brand new gold pin tucked inside his envelope. Bloody hell! James gasped. What the fuck? Sirius frowned. Language! Mrs. Potter scolded them both. She'd been very proud, of course, but James was only interested in telling Lily and rushed to owl her at once. In less than half an hour, they learned that she'd been made head girl. It's fate! James declared. Destiny! They used flu powder to get to the Leaky Cauldron, a homely, old-fashioned wizard pub which doubled up as a B&B, &B, meeting place and general community centre as far as Remus could tell. James had booked two twin rooms, and after being greeted by the odd-looking hunchbacked publican, the four marauders hauled their school trunks up the stairs to settle in. Remus was sharing with Peter, because neither Remus nor Sirius could come up with an excuse for sharing together. The rooms were adjoining, which was some small comfort, but not much. Diagon Alley was not like Hogsmeade, as Remus had thought it might be. It was more packed in, bustling, noisy, the wizarding equivalent of cosmopolitan. The streets were busy with throngs of students, and every shop was packed to the rafters. Gringotts was the first port of call for everyone, and Remus followed James and Sirius round the palatial bank, struck dumb by the complete alienness of everything. Remus had never been in a muggle bank before, but nothing could have prepared him for Gringotts, goblins and secret passageways and mountains and mountains of gold. James and Sirius swanned about like VIP members. Mind you, they probably were. The goblins groveled at their feet, which Remus found hugely distasteful, but couldn't really say anything about. He wished Lily were there, or Marlene and Mary, anyone a bit more down to earth. Remus had found he'd been left just under 400 galleons in the vault which had once belonged to Lyle Lupin. This sounded like an enormous amount to Remus, until he saw the pitying look on Sirius's face. He quietly took out enough for his books and some new robes, as well as a bit of spending cash to convert to muggle money. Remus was so shattered after the full moon and the flu powder and the bank that once he'd withdrawn his money he had to go back to the room at the leaky cauldron to collapse. The others promised him they'd leave off shopping until the next day and would spend the rest of the afternoon looking at brooms and quidditch supplies. Remus was too tired to care and crashed out on his little single bed, dead to the world for at least fifteen hours. He didn't even wake when the others came clattering in at midnight, 
smelling strongly of whiskey, loudly shushing each other and giggling. The next day Lily arrived and their school shopping began in earnest. She and Remus had similarly methodical minds when it came to completing tasks, and conferred privately on a plan of action before ordering the other three boys about for the rest of the morning. Remus wished he could have more time in flourish and blots, but as they had done books last, being the heaviest items on the list, James, Sirius and Peter were seriously flagging by this point, and on the verge of mutiny if they didn't get some ice cream. So, back to the leaky cauldron to dump their goods and have some lunch, for God's sake, James, you can't have ice cream just before you've had any real food. That's ridiculous. Then to Florian Fortescue's, where Sirius tried to buy Remus a scoop of every flavour. Come on, Mooney, it's only fair. You've never tried them before. How will you know which one is your favourite? Once all of this had been completed, Remus found his energy almost completely depleted once again, and it was only two in the afternoon. He considered taking a quick nap, but it was their last night in London, and he had one thing he really needed to do before leaving. It took a little while to get a quiet moment to himself, but in the gents at Florian Fortescue's, Remus took the opportunity to pull out his pocket watch. He clicked it open, the mechanism every bit as satisfying as it had been the first time he used it, and whispered, Grant Chapman, at the compass half. He expected the arrow to start pointing east, but much to his alarm, it began to spin uncontrollably around faster and faster. The compass had not come with instructions, but Remus had a sinking feeling that something he'd known all along was finally being confirmed. Grant was not safe. Grant needed help. Remus hurried back to the little table outside the parlour where his four friends were sitting, making a lot of raucous noise over something Peter had just done with his milkshake. All right, Mooney, Sirius grinned as Remus hovered nearby. This lot want to go and do some sightseeing stuff, but it sounds boring. Want to bunk off Don Carnaby Street, finally? Yeah, great, Remus said, forcing a grin. He widened his eyes at Sirius, hoping he got the message. Thankfully, Sirius was very skilled at following secret signals and came over at once. What's up? he whispered. You look a right state. I have to go and find Grant, Remus said, agitated. Look! He showed Sirius the compass's mad spinning. Right now, Sirius frowned. But we're going to... Now! Remus said. I can't explain it. I just have to. I know I have to. Could you tell James and Peter something? I don't know what. Just if they ask. What? No, I'm coming with you. Sirius. Remus. Sirius mocked his stern tone and quirked an eyebrow. Remus sighed. This was probably one of those things he was supposed to include Sirius in. He swallowed his temper and relented. Okay, fine. Shall we just tell the others where we're going? No, don't argue with me on this. He didn't want anyone else knowing about Grant. Sirius, apparently recognising that Remus would only go so far, nodded and didn't push his luck. They told the others they were going to Carnaby Street to look at the shops, paid and hurried away without looking back. They had to go and change into muggle clothes first, and once they'd left Diagon Alley, they headed for Charing Cross Station and caught two tubes to the squat and mile end, which Remus thought was probably the best starting point. By the time they got there, it was almost four in the afternoon. Remus wasn't sure if it was a year of neglect or just hindsight that made the run-down block of tenements look much less welcoming than they had last summer. The smell of damp was stronger, part of the linoleum seemed to have been ripped up, exposing dirty, cracked cream tile. It was a warm day, but it still felt cold inside. Ads, the man Remus had met the year before, was the only one of the original crowd still living there. Grant? He scratched his head, looking dazed. Yeah, I think you went out west when it was too rough round here. Hammersmith, maybe. Knocking this place down next week. I'm going to Brixton. Hammersmith, he said. That's the other side of town. Yeah, made some friends out there, I reckon. Grant's always good at making friends, when it suits him. He said that a bit sharply. Remus didn't like it, and automatically made himself taller, squaring his shoulders. Ads looked him up and down irritably and snapped, Look, if he don't want to be found, he won't be. So back on the central line and across the city they went. As they passed Tottenham Court Road, Remus felt guilty for ruining Sirius's day in Muggle London and secretly promised to make it up to him when next they had a chance. Still, Sirius was having a surprisingly good time, as enthralled by the escalators and ticket barriers as Remus had been at Gringotts. 
They changed at Notting Hill, then walked, because Remus didn't have a clue where he was going, except for his nose and the compass, which was spinning less erratically now and seemed to be trying to lead in a vague direction. It's amazing, Sirius said, staring up at the houses as they walked, peering into shop windows and stopping to watch double-decker buses shunt past. I've lived in London most of my life, and I've never seen it like this. Glad you're having fun, Remus said, distracted. They were in Shepherd's Bush now, he was pretty sure. It was past six in the evening and he was slowing down. His hip hurt from the rattling about on the underground, his shins were sore from the walking, and his back hurt because of Moody's awful binding spell. "'Let's sit down a minute,' Sirius asked with a look of deep concern. "'Look, there's a park over there.' It was Shepherd's Bush Green. At least Remus knew where they were. He consented to rest only for a short while. He was mostly worried that once he'd sat down it would be impossible to get back up. "'Then I'll carry you,' Sirius said. "'Piss off, will you?' Remus snorted, resting his elbows on his knees and leaning forward. He pulled out the compass to check it once more. Oh, "'It's going mental again,' he groaned. "'I thought I was getting somewhere.' "'It might be because you're agitated,' Sirius suggested delicately. "'Um, you know, because it feeds off of your emotions toward the person you're looking for. "'So maybe if you... are you telling me to calm down?' Remus frowned. It might help, Sirius replied evenly. How about you tell me something about Grant? Something nice? If you think it'll help. They didn't have time for this. Grant needed him right now. But at this point, Remus was willing to try anything, even if it was just a ploy from Sirius to get more information. Uh, his name's Grant Chapman. I met him at St. Edmund's in 1975. He liked the same music as me. He's friendly. Er, uh, what does he look like? You've seen him. Not properly. I was a dog. Anyway, the point is to get you to think about him. I'm doing nothing but think about him, Remus snapped. He closed his eyes and breathed in. Fair hair, curls, er, uh, I think blue eyes. Yeah, blue. He has a crooked front tooth. Last time I saw him, he was thinner. A swell of anxiety rose in his throat. Uh, he stammered. Go on, Sirius encouraged. You like the same music? So, Bowie? T-Rex? Yeah, and he likes, um, Deep Purple. Cool, okay. So that's how you became friends? Yeah, Remus nodded, feeling a bit better, focusing on the positive. He was the only one at St. Eddie's that wasn't a complete maniac or a criminal. I mean, he had a few charges, but not, like, not serious. Then one day he, well, he just kissed me, and that's how I knew. Remus glanced at Sirius quickly to check that it was okay to keep going. Sirius's smile had tightened a bit, but he nodded again. He's been a good friend, apart from that, Remus explained. He never makes me feel bad about myself. He never makes me feel odd or different. He sounds like a really great mate. Sirius said politely. Yeah, and he'd do anything for me. That's why I need to... He looked down at the compass and saw that it was now pointing west. A little shaky, but clear enough for Remus. They got up and followed. It was past seven now. They hadn't eaten since lunch and the sun was beginning to set. Lily, James and Peter would no doubt be wondering where they were. Sirius didn't complain, just kept quiet and followed while Remus mumbled to himself, following the little golden arrow on his palm, and sniffing the thick London air. Shepherd's Bush wasn't much nicer than Mile End, and seemed to have a buzzing nightlife. Pubs and clubs were filling up all round them with teens and young people from every subculture. Disco kids in bright satin and sequins, grimy skinheads in suspenders and boots, old-school rockers with shaggy hair, and punks with studded jackets and faces full of metal. Finally, as they were coming up on Latimer Road, Remus stopped still. There, he said, pointing across the darkening street to a building with blacked-out windows and steps leading down into a basement. Loud music was pounding up onto the street, whoever the band was. They had little regard for their instruments, and even less for the audience's eardrums. He's in there, Remus said firmly. The compass confirmed this, pointing straight ahead. The basement looked a bit livelier than Remus was comfortable with, 
as well as the music, loud shouts and screams were blaring from inside. East End accents, teenage rage. Skinny, yellow-toothed punks stood outside in packs, green spiky hair and heavy bite chains. Remus felt horribly vulnerable in his own worn-out corduroys and oversized granddad shirt, but Sirius was even more out of place with his long hippie hair and unmistakably well-bred posture. "'Shall we go in?' Sirius asked without a trace of nerves. "'Um,' Remus said. He was about to suggest that he go alone when fate intervened. "'Sling your hook, you fancy Nancy boy!' The bouncer was yelling at a young man who was staggering out into the street, head bent, hand in pockets. He had a mass of dirty blonde hair and a scent that Remus would know anywhere on earth. Grant! Remus bolted toward him, running across the road without even looking. Grant didn't hear and was making his way slowly down the street, hunched over. There was something wrong with the way he was walking. His gait twisted and skewed. He reeked of cheap gin, even standing metres away. The punks were leering at him, yelling vile obscenities to chase him off. Grant turned and sneered back, throwing up two fingers and wobbling incoherently. Grant! Remus said again, catching him up beneath a yellow street light. Grant finally stopped and turned, squinting. The wall behind him had been spray painted with various disparate slogans Eat the rich, Buzz kids and the girl next door don't want to play in your Cold War, Fuck national service. "'Jesus Christ, what are you doing here?' Grant lurched and wobbled, drunk, leaned against a wall and clutched side, as if something was hurting him there. "'Looking for you!' Remus walked up to him, trying to see his face obscured by shadow. "'Right, obviously. Bloody hell, how do you manage it every time?' Grant shook his head. He didn't look good. He looked dreadful. He was thin, thinner than he should be, thinner than was really healthy. His hair was lank and looked as if it hadn't been washed in a while, and he had a patchwork of bruises down one side of his face, disappearing under his shirt, purple and ugly. What happened to you? Fucking punk happened, didn't it? Grant laughed, a horrid choking sound, then staggered again and sat on the pavement. Sorry, mate. Bit dizzy. He retched a few times, but nothing came up, so he spat. Remus squatted beside him, hands trembling. Who did this? Did it happen in there? He leaned over, trying to get a proper look at Grant's poor, battered face. It was definitely Grant, but he was changed almost beyond recognition. Gone was the bright blue denim in cheeky grin, Remus remembered. Replaced by torn black drainpipes, haunted sallow eyes, nasty-looking piercings in his nose, eyebrow lip that were definitely infected. "'You're off!' Gran swung out, wildly, drunkenly. He wouldn't have hit Remus, and it wouldn't have hurt if he had, but Sirius leapt forward in an instant. "'Oi, back off, mate!' Grant blinked and looked up at Sirius, raising a hand to shield his eyes from the brightness of the street lamps. He frowned, then sneered. "'Who the fuck are you? Piss off, will ya? I'm talking to my mate.' He turned to Remus. Fancy a pint? And tried to haul himself back to his feet. Remus helped him, gripping him firmly under the elbow. I don't think you need any more to drink. How about some dinner? A flash of sobriety returned to Grant's features. Got cash? Yeah, of course, Remus nodded, trying to guide him away from the horrible street they were on. Come on, I'll buy you dinner. What would you like? Uh, you know me. <laughs> I'm easy. Grant cackled, leaning heavily against him, but at least allowing himself to be led. Sirius followed, looking uncomfortable. Grant didn't even notice until they reached a cafe somewhere up the road. Sobering up a bit by then, he was still leaning on Remus, and Remus could hear a strange hitch in his breath that told him Grant was in pain. In here? Remus turned to Sirius, questioning. Sirius glanced at the illuminated window, the cheap plastic chairs inside, with a faint look of disdain, but shrugged. Probably the best we'll find around here. You again, Grant grumbled. Thought I told you to nap off. Grant, Remus said gently. This is Sirius, my friend from school. Grant did a double take, narrowing his eyes. 
or I, anyway. Only one of them opened properly. Well, fuck me, he murmured, still swaying. Proper stunner! Sirius looked embarrassed, so Remus herded Grant into the cafe to sit down, ordering three cups of tea and a pie and chips, chicken and mushroom. I don't want no trouble from you, the burly man behind the counter said as he set the mugs of greyish tea down. I know your types. Piss off, you dirty old man, Grant slurred. Bet you'd pay for it if you could. What did I say? Look, Remus stood up quickly. He's sobering up. I'll keep him quiet, I swear. I'll pay it up front. He'll be okay once he's eating. The large man looked at him appraisingly. His eyes flicked to Syria, still seated, then Grant, then back to Remus. What are you, Christian Outreach? Sort of, Remus nodded, trying to look religious, whatever religious looked like. Anyway, it satisfied the cafe owner, who lumbered back behind his counter, presumably to heat up their food. Cool. Grant laughed into his tea. You get posher by the bloody year, Remus, me old mucker. Will you just stop trying to fight everyone for five minutes? Grant blew a raspberry, then giggled. When the food arrived, Grant tucked in as if he hadn't eaten in weeks. Remus hoped that wasn't true, but judging by the state of his bony frame, things didn't look good. The pie and chips were demolished in minutes, and Remus ordered a Bakewell tart for afters, as well as some more tea. "'Where are you living?' he asked, hoping he sounded kind and not accusatory. "'What are you doing in that club?' "'Getting bladdered,' Grant murmured. He was calmer now that he'd eaten, slower and more pliant. "'Well, you've achieved that. The bruises!' Grant looked up, suddenly right at Remus. He was stone-cold sober, his eyes sharp and wide, as if Remus's face was a mirror and he was seeing himself for the first time. He touched his grubby fingers to the marred side of his cheek. Gone to an altercation a few days ago, he said. But fuck it, I'm off tomorrow, going down to Brighton. Sick of bloody London. Sick of bloody miserable fucking London. Everyone wants to get at you. Do you over, any way they can. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, Remus breathed. He felt so helpless. He wanted to look to Sirius for reassurance, but it seemed somehow disrespectful to Grant. Oh, school, Bosch snob? Grant asked, slurping his tea like a builder. Oh, you know, fine. What's in Brighton? Somewhere to live? A job? How are you getting there? Got friends. Grant shrugged, then winced. He'd broken a rib, Remus realised, and scolded himself for not having noticed earlier. Do you need to go to a hospital? How long have you been like this? No hospitals, Grant mumbled, curling up in his seat protectively. I think I'm a skaghead. Probably look like one, do I? I went to Mile End. I saw ads. That cunt. He can fuck right off in all. Look, lend me a tenner, will ya? I'm good for it. Give me your address and I'll pay you back. Not if you're just going to go get drunk on it. Oi, Mr. I am mighty. I'll have you know I deserve a good drink. I've had me heart broken. You'll remember what that's like. He gave Sirius a less than subtle glare. Sirius, to his credit, didn't react but stared at the sugar bowl. Someone had put their cigarette out in it. I'm really sorry, Grant, Remus said sincerely. Look, where are you sleeping at the moment? Up the road. Is it safe there? Lost the key. Well, thought Remus to himself, at least there's a lock. He'd been halfway to deciding to smuggle Grant back to Diagon Alley and just facing the consequences when they got caught. They ordered more tea and Grant ate some more. Once he'd finished, he'd grown agreeably soft and sleepy, drunk on a full stomach. Sirius and Remus helped him back to his room in an old Edwardian terrace which looked as though it had been abandoned for years. Still inside was busier than homelier than the condemned Mile End building. A young woman peered out of the next room along, mousy, freckle-faced at odds with her gunge-green mohawk. Grant! God, you pissed again! I told you vodka's not a fucking painkiller to go to a bloody doctor! She looked up at Remus. Who are you? A friend. I'm just trying to make sure he's okay. He'll be fine, he gets like this. 
Sirius performed a silent unlocking charm on Grant's door, and Remus half carried Grant inside, settling him as carefully as he could on the single mattress on the floor. It was a small room, with one tiny round window. Unfurnished, there was a stack of magazines in one corner, with a lamp perched on top, a rucksack stuffed with clothes, a mirror which was rusting round the edges, and what looked like a small washing station, a bar of soap, a toothbrush, an empty bowl. Grant curled up on the mattress and began to snore softly. Remus knelt beside him, frowning. The punk girl stood in the doorway, arms folded, looking serious up and down. "'He says he's going to Brighton tomorrow,' Remus said to her. "'Is that true?' "'If he got the money together for his train fare,' she shrugged. "'Said he got nicked last week. He was seeing this really rough time. Treated him like shit, poor love.' "'He'll have the money,' Remus said firmly. "'Will you make sure he goes? It'll be safe.' Well, "'I'm not his keeper,' she shrugged, backing out. "'I've got enough problems.' "'Charming,' Sirius said with a raised eyebrow as she vanished back in the next room. "'Shut the door,' Remus said, pulling out his wand. He wanted to fix as much as he could while Grant was still sleeping. He ran through his list of healing spells. He'd only done them on himself so far, but nothing had gone very badly wrong. "'What the hell are you doing?' Sirius came over as Remus aimed his wand at Grant's chest. "'What about the Statute of Secrecy?' "'Bugger that!' Remus grunted. "'I can't just leave him like this!' Sirius stepped back and watched as Remus did his best to heal Grant's ribs, then clear up the bruises and blackened eye. Afterwards he leaned back, mind racing. He turned to Sirius. "'Right, I think I need to stay here tonight,' he said. "'I could leave him some money, but... I think it's better if I make sure he gets to Brighton tomorrow, if that's still what he wants to do when he's sober. Right, Sirius nodded. We've got to get to King's Cross, though. Yeah, I'll be on time. I can just apparate from Victoria. Okay, Sirius nodded again. He sat down, leaning against the opposite wall. He took off his jacket and folded it underneath himself. What are you doing? Remus asked. You need to go back to Diagon Alley. No, I don't, Sirius shrugged. I can stay. But James... Oh, yeah, right. Hang on. Sirius reached into his pocket and pulled out the compact mirror. Remus gazed at it enviously. He wished he'd had one. He'd give it to Grant and never lose him again. Oi, Potter, you there? Brongs! Sirius was speaking into the device. Hiya. Look, me and Mooney are going to a gig here. We'll be in late. Don't tell anyone, okay? See you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. No, I promise. Okay. Cheers. He snapped it closed and looked at Remus. There. Done. You didn't have to do that. If you're worried about leaving me with him, I'm really just making sure he's okay. And I'm making sure you're okay, Remus, Sirius replied coolly. I'm not leaving you to spend all night alone in this place. Come on, let's get comfortable. Plenty of floor to go around. Remus's guilt soared even higher then, as Sirius gave him a bright grin and extended an arm toward him. His last night before school, spent on the floor of some muggle halfway house, and he wasn't even complaining about it. Remus sat down too and slouched down to settle under Sirius's arm. At least they were together now. Sirius kissed his head, and they both watched Grant, sleeping like a child. "'I'm sorry,' Remus said, exhausted. "'He's not... I don't want you to think he usually acts this way. He's obviously had a bad time.' "'What happened to him?' Sirius asked very quietly. "'What happened to make him end up here, like this?' "'He got kicked out of St. Edmund's two years ago?' Remus yawned, his eyes growing heavy. "'Didn't have anywhere else to go. Can't get a job because he didn't do his exams at school. And I'm guessing he hasn't got a proper address.' "'Remus? Hmm. This wouldn't happen to you, would it? Because you've got us.' "'Yeah,' he murmured sleepily, only half paying attention. "'I've got you, Padfoot. Don't worry about me.' Chapter 119, Seventh Year, Back to School For a horrible moment, just as he woke up, Remus forgot where he was. He took in the stuffy air, the faint whiff of rotten newspaper, body odour, and urine. 
He took in the hard floor, which had exacerbated his various aches and pains overnight. Then he opened his eyes and saw Grant, lying on the mattress opposite, staring back at him. He looked a bit better. Morning, Grant mouthed. Morning, Remus replied, moving against Sirius, who was still fast asleep, head back against the wall. He peeled himself away carefully and whispered to Grant, Don't worry, he sleeps like the dead. I'll wake him up in a bit. I can't remember much, Grant whispered, lying on his side, head resting on a pillow which looked dirty and stained. Sorry if I was a knob. I think I am a bit of a knob these days. You were fine, Remus shook his head. Just sad, maybe. Grant looked stricken, so Remus moved to get up. Lou? he asked. Downstairs, I'll show you. Grant pulled himself up gingerly, then looked amazed. Blimey, he said, patting his side. Must have been a bruise after all. Knew I didn't need no doctor. Remus pursed his lips and followed Grant out. Downstairs was already alive with activity, despite the early hour. The house seemed to be a kind of commune, full of all kinds of different people. There was an outhouse in the back garden, more like a yard that had been turned into an allotment, and an outdoor shower, which Remus couldn't imagine was much fun in winter. Still, the people were friendly and all said hello to the two boys as they passed, which Remus remarked upon. Everyone seems nice. Oh, all right, Grant replied from inside the loo. Only been here a few days, leaving as soon as I can. For Brighton? You mentioned that last night. Oh, did I? Well, that was the plan. Grant came out of the outhouse looking sheepish. Maybe next month, though. What's there, friends? Grant nodded. Yeah, I'm one of the nicer lads from the Moyle End place. Got a cousin there, too. My last chapman who don't hate me. She owns a pub. Said she'd hired me if I could get my shit together and pay the train fare. He sighed heavily, washing his hands, then face in a bucket of water taken from a big green water butt standing by the back door. Supposed to prove myself. That doesn't seem very... What did Remus want to say? Familial? Kind? Grant had clearly experienced very little of either. Nah, she's fair enough, Grant replied, feeling in his pockets and coming up empty. Remus handed over his own tin of roll-ups in the lighter. Grant nodded appreciatively and continued explaining as he lit up. I've let her down a few times before. Mostly if Grandad was involved. You know, I can't stick him. Remus nodded, trying to be understanding. Grant had a huge family, Irish Catholic, he'd said once, but relations between them were often fraught, particularly where his patriarchal grandfather was concerned. Don't get me wrong, Grant was saying. I was really going, this time I was, but it just turned out wrong again. A lot's turned out wrong, to be honest. Remus wanted to hug him, but he looked so thin, so wiry and prickly, it made him afraid to. How much is it? he asked, digging into his pockets. I've got a bit of money left by my dad. You can have the fare. I'll take you to the station today. Couldn't do that. Grant held up his hands. Not to keep, obviously, Remus said quickly. You owe me. Look, I've got one more year of school. Then I'll come and find you, and you'll have been working in your cousin's pub, right? So you can pay me back. How much? Tenner? Four quid, Grant sighed. I had four quid last week, too, but I... I lost it. I didn't drink it, I promise. Four quid? I can lend you that, that's fine. Are you serious? Grant stared at him, blinking. Of course, Remus nodded, frowning slightly. Why not? You do the same for me. All right. Grant shook his head, then pressed the heel of his hand into one eye, as if overcome with emotion. Thanks, Remus. You're such a good mate. You do the same for me. Remus replied. It occurred to him for the first time that he and Grant were actually the same age. Grant had always been so knowing, so streetwise, so protective, that Remus had considered him older, more mature. But he was only seventeen, and life had been as cruel to Grant as it had to Remus, perhaps even more cruel, because after all, Remus knew in his heart he would never be homeless. He would never be alone while the marauders were there. He needed to learn to stop putting people on pedestals, Stop expecting so much from everybody. He stepped forward then and hugged the other boy, finding not to burn himself on the cigarette. When you get so tall anyway, Grant laughed, muffled under Remus's arm. Don't, 
Remus chuckled, pulling back. Sirius teases me all the time. Sirius. Grant shook his head in amazement. Sirius and Remus. Bloody hell, is it him? That posh lad that broke your heart? Uh, yeah. It's okay now, though. I hope so, Remus, mate. There was time for Grant to pack his meagre possessions and for Sirius and Remus to take him for breakfast at a small cafe in Victoria Station. You gonna make me fat, he said to Remus as he scoffed down his second bacon butty. No chance, Remus said, prodding him in the ribs. Sirius had been quiet all morning, but he never did function well on a poor night's sleep. He looked only slightly rumpled, his hair a little less lustrous than usual, his eyes a bit foggy. Remus could tell that he was still fascinated by the sights and sounds of Muggle London, only, of course, he couldn't explain that to Grant. Grant regarded Sirius with a similar wariness. He apologised for his behaviour the night before and tried to explain that they caught him on a bad night. He seemed meeker in front of Sirius, less cheeky, perhaps perceiving him as a social superior and therefore mildly dangerous. Remus well remembered how alien Potter and Black had been to him once upon a time. You two got your own train to catch, eh? Grant said, his eyes flicking to Sirius, then Remus, then back again. Yeah, but we've got time, Remus said. Here, I want to give you this. He handed Grant a scrap of paper which held the Potter's address on it. It's where I'm living when I'm not at school. Will you send me a letter when you're settled? A postcard? Promise. Yeah, all right. Grant nodded, tucking it away. Warning you, though. My handwriting's shit and I can't spell for toffee. I don't care about that. I just want to know where you are next time. Do you need stamps? I should have thought of stamps. I can get stamps. Grant touched his arm. You've done enough, honest. They hugged him again on the platform. Grant shook Sirius's hand, which was weird, but polite of him. "'I'll come and visit at Christmas, maybe, or next summer,' Remus said. "'I bloody well believe you, too. Can't get rid of you, can I?' Grant grinned, his first genuine smile so far. It made Remus feel somewhat easier. "'Like magnets, you and me, eh? Always snap right back together.' This hit Remus in such a way that he had to hug Grant again, until the other boy laughed and pushed him away. All right, all right. I've got a train to catch, you know. And of course, so did Remus and Sirius. As soon as Grant had disappeared through the train doors, they bolted toward the gentlemen toilets to apparate to King's Cross. Inside the cubicle, Sirius finally spoke. He touched Remus's arms where Grant had only been a few minutes ago. You look exhausted. Let me do it. You can side along. Really? Remus could have said that he was no more tired than Sirius, who had put up with just as much as he had, but that would have been a lie. He was too tired to argue, even. Really? Sirius nodded, taking his arm. Thank you for staying with me. Thank you for helping him. Don't be silly. Sirius gave him a small smile. He obviously... He loves you. He... But Remus had no chance to finish his thought. He was spinning through space, noise and colour blurring as he and Sirius left Victoria and landed, fairly gracefully, just outside of King's Cross. They had no choice but to run for the platform and found James hanging out the train door, waving frantically, "'Fucking hell, where have you been?' "'Language?' Lily's face poked out of the window along. "'Your head boy now, you should be setting an example.' "'I am setting an example, telling these wankers off!' James retorted as Remus and Sirius clambered onto the train just as the guard's whistle blew. "'Language!' Lily said again. "'Honestly, James, you really need to start growing up this year. You're of age. You need to start acting—' "'Isn't she brilliant?' James beamed at Remus, who was now sitting on the floor of the carriage, catching his breath. Sirius was bent over, hands on his knees, looking shockingly unserious, red in the face, hair everywhere. James regarded them both, folding his arms, gold-head boy and Quidditch captain badges glinting on his dark robes. So, where were you? Told you. Gig! Sirius huffed. Which band? You don't know em. Muggle band. Why didn't you come back last night? Where did you sleep? Sirius flashed a nervous look at Remus, and Remus could see he was on the verge of spilling everything. He stood up quickly. We didn't sleep. He went on all night. We had breakfast and came straight here. Sirius stared at him in amazement before nodding along. James shook his head. 
mental, and dangerous. Seriously, lads, don't do that again. Won't, Sirius murmured, looking at his feet. Lily appeared in the corridor, hands on her hips, looking beautiful and terrifying. Potter, she said, we've got to lead the meeting. Right you are, James grinned, forgetting all about his two out-of-breath friends, following the redhead away toward the prefect's carriage. See you later, boys, he called absent-mindedly. You really are a good liar, Sirius said to Remus. Maybe it was lack of sleep or pain in his hip, but this statement rubbed Remus the wrong way. What's that supposed to mean? he snapped. Nothing, Sirius looked down again. Come on, let's find Pete. Peter was sitting with Mary, Marlene and Dorcas in the carriage Lily had just exited. He looked a bit outnumbered as the girls were swapping tips for fingernail strengthening charms. We thought you missed a train, Marlene said as Remus and Sirius entered. You know me, McKinnon, Sirius gave his most charming grin. Like to make an entrance. And now you're dragging poor Remus down with you, Mary laughed. Come sit here, Lupin. I'll protect you from that delinquent. She budged up in her seat to make room by the window. Remus took the space gratefully. Where were you? Peter asked. You left me all alone with Lily and James. I might as well have been a ghost. Gig. Stayed out late. Didn't sleep. Sirius waved a hand, yawning. He sat opposite Remus and folded his arms, leaning tiredly against the window. The train began to move and Remus closed his eyes, because he was exhausted, but also because that way he didn't have to answer any more questions about where he'd been. The girls began to speak more quietly and he eventually drifted off to sleep. When he woke up, they were already in Scotland, the dark rolling hills whooshing past, a smattering of rain hitting the windows. Sirius was curled up on the seat opposite him, completely hidden under everyone else's cloaks. Remus could hear him breathing evenly. Fast asleep. Mary was just sliding the door open as Remus stretched, waving at her sleepily. She smiled and waved back, but looked serious. Marlene frowned. What's up? I just saw Lily, Mary whispered. Something happened in the prefect's carriage. She glanced over at Sirius, still just a lump underneath the cloaks, and lowered her voice even further so that Remus and Marlene had to lean in. James and Regulus got into a fight. They're both okay, but it got quite nasty by the sounds of it. Regulus was saying some really crazy stuff. Lily was really shaken. He's one of them, Marlene whispered, looking anxious. The Black family are you-know-who's strongest supporters. Everyone knows it. Shh. Remus said quickly. We don't know what it was about. It could have been anything. The girls fell quiet after that, but exchanged concerned looks with each other, and Remus could tell they thought he was being naive. He leaned back and looked out the window for a while, listening to Sirius's relaxed heartbeat, and worrying about Grant, and wishing more than ever that the worst was already behind them. Chapter 120 Seventh Year Thunder. Neither Remus nor Peter, who'd also been in the carriage, said anything to Sirius about Mary's intel. Peter probably kept quiet because he wasn't sure how valuable the information was. Remus kept quiet because he was a coward, and if there had to be bad news, he preferred that James delivered it. And sure enough, James appeared to meet them all on the train platform with a very red-looking eye and a rumpled school uniform. What happened to you? Sirius yawned, oblivious. Tell you later, James murmured, before jogging over to join Lily in herding the first years in the right direction. It was still raining slightly and growing dark outside already. Remus was very glad not to be crossing the lake. Still, it was bittersweet climbing into the horseless carriages one last time with Sirius, Mary and Marlene. Peter decided to follow the honey and get in with Dorcas and her friends. As they pulled into the castle courtyard, Remus looked up at the towering stone and wondered if this would be his final memory of arriving at Hogwarts. Perhaps they would all be back for a reunion party in ten years. That was a pleasant thought, though 1987 seemed completely impossible right then. Remus tried to pay close attention to the sorting ceremony, the nervous line of tiny first years, the battered old hat, McGonagall's stern but caring countenance, he tried to imprint every moment in his memory, but it wasn't easy. There were so many distractions. First there was James's eye, which he's still not explained. Then there was Regulus, who was conspicuously absent. 
Snape glowering as always, his eyes never leaving the back of Lily Evans's head. Christopher, who kept trying to catch Remus's eye, and Sirius, who was completely unaware of everything and simply thrilled to be back at Hogwarts, his true home. Remus was trying to enjoy Sirius's good mood without looking too much like he was staring. It was a real art. Just as Dumbledore announced that dinner was served, the doors at the back of the hall flew open. All heads turned to see, except for Remus, who only needed to see the smile die on Sirius's face to know who it was. Regulus did not hurry to his seat, as Remus probably would have, embarrassed to draw attention. No, Regulus was a black through and through, and walked with his usual regal bearing, slowly and with purpose, head held high. There was no evidence that James had done any damage, but Remus thought that Reg was looking even paler than usual, and dark round the eyes, as if he'd lost a lot of sleep lately. The six-year Slytherins made a big show of making room for him, as if he were the guest of honour rather than their schoolmate. Even Snape's attention was momentarily diverted as he leaned across to shake Regulus's hand. All of this took up only a few moments, but it left an indelible mark on the Gryffindor seventh years as they eyed Sirius warily. Mate, James said very quietly, I need to tell you something in private. Later. He glanced up at Remus and Peter as he said this, so they knew they were included in this. Sirius just nodded and kept his head down for the rest of the meal, only picking at his food. Remus's heart ached, but there was nothing he could do. His sense of separation was inadvertently exacerbated by Lily and James, who kept squeezing each other's hands under the table. Remus didn't know when he and Sirius would next have the chance to be alone. After dinner, it was an almost unbearable wait for Lily and James to finish up their new duties as head boy and girl. Remus was nodding in his armchair, failing to focus on his Care of Magical Creatures N.E.W.T. text, eyelids growing heavier and heavier. Psst! Mooney! James woke him up, finally, with a gentle shake. Come on, we're all going up. Remus blinked, staring about himself in surprise. The common room was almost empty. Upstairs in their bedroom, all of their trunks had arrived, their beds were made and pyjamas laid out. Rain was still battering the window panes and Remus could smell a storm on its way, electricity and pressure making the air feel too thick and too close. Sirius was pacing, and though a window was open, the room stank of cigarettes from his chain-smoking. He'd showered at some point, and his hair was still damp at the ends, dripping onto the maroon t-shirt he wore to bed. Peter was just coming out of the bathroom, already in his pyjamas and smelling faintly of toothpaste. "'You didn't wake me up,' Remus said neutrally to Sirius. Sirius shrugged carelessly, sitting down on his bed. "'You looked comfortable. Thought you could probably do with the rest.' He turned to James. Well? It's about Regulus, James said, not beating round the bush. He give you that? Sirius nodded at James's now very prominent black eye. Yeah, James nodded. He looked angry. A strange emotion on James. Yeah, we had a few words in the prefect's carriage. Words? Yeah. James's jaw was tight and the back of his neck flushed red. He flexed his wrists. Seems like Regulus and some of his mates have a problem with Evans being head girl. Oh, no, Peter said, realising what had happened. James, he didn't. He was all talk, James said. But you weren't, Sirius said. He was still sitting on his bed, his shoulders slumped. Prongs, Remus sighed impatiently. You didn't attack him first. You know that's exactly what the lot of them want from our side. You should have just ignored him. He didn't make it very easy, James snapped, still wound up. Anyway, don't bother. I've had all this from Lily. Remus wondered what she had to say. He couldn't imagine that she would have taken very kindly to James playing the White Knight. But then, Mary had said she'd been very shaken. I didn't hurt him, anyway, James carried on. He'd begun to pace the room now that Sirius had stopped. Just wanted him to shut up. I was going to use silencio and maybe scourgeify his mouth, you know. But the little weasel dodged it and just tried to get me back, so I used jelly legs. That's when Mulciber swung for me and Evans petrified all three of us. Just for a few minutes. Still, I got Regulus, so he had to go up to the hospital wing and it all got written up. Are you in trouble? Peter asked, chewing his fingernails. Nah. James waved a hand. 
Loads of witnesses said Reg was asking for it, and in the end it was Gryffindor versus Slytherin, so McGonagall and Slughorn agreed to give us a chance to be civil. He pulled a face at this. But is Reg okay? Sirius asked quietly. Yeah, fine, James nodded. He stopped moving and scratched his head awkwardly. There's something else, though. Sirius looked up, his arms folded across his body, but not in a defiant way, more as if to protect himself. What? Regulus, when Lily petrified him, he fell, and we had to lift him up onto a seat. He'd rolled his sleeves up to duel, and when I was moving him, I saw... I saw... on his arm... Prongs? Sirius was staring at his friend with such a burning in his eyes that his pupils were twin flames. He looked desperate, as if willing James not to tell him. He's got the mark. Peter made a noise and sat down hard on his bed. Remus bit his lip and stayed still, because he couldn't think of anything else to do that wouldn't look suspicious. Sirius swallowed. Remus could see his Adam's apple bob, then looked down, then back at James. Now he looked defiant. He gave another shrug, which was probably meant to be casual, except he was still hugging himself, so it looked petulant. He tossed his hair. Well, then, he said. Suppose we know how my family spent this summer, then. Fine. That's fine. He picked his side. I've picked mine. He nodded as if agreeing with himself. Fine, he repeated. Padfoot, James reached out to his friend. I'm angry with Reg, okay? I'm not... It's nothing to do with you. Everyone knows you're not one of them. I know, Sirius said, almost violently. It's fine! He squeezed his hands tighter over his arms, and Remus felt dizzy with the urge to run over and wrap his own arms round him. Is Evans okay? Yeah, she's fine, James said. I mean, I think she was hurt, but... Well, she's tougher than me. Cooler under pressure. Want me to have a word? With Reg, I mean? I'd leave it, mate. James shook his head. McGonagall and Slughorn know everything now. You'll only make it worse. Everything? Sirius looked up again. The rims of his eyes were red, but that might just be tiredness. Not everything, James admitted. Not about the mark. I wanted to leave that up to you. Okay. Sirius looked down again. They were all quiet for a long time, before James tried again, heroically. Do you want to talk about it? No, Sirius replied. I just want to go to bed. Yeah, good idea, James said, running his fingers through his hair. He was doing the usual James thing, taking charge, assessing, and managing the serious thing, but the wind was obviously out of his sails. He wasn't sure what to do. Remus wished he could tell him, telepathically. He knew exactly the right thing. But it was a bad idea. No need to add his own nonsense to the pile. He would simply have to wait. They all got ready for bed quietly, unpacking a few things, reclaiming their space in the bathroom counter, settling back into the comfortable and familiar room in which they'd shared an entire childhood. Remus took a quick shower to wash London off him, then brushed his teeth and dressed for bed. When he opened the door again, he found the curtains drawn round all the beds except his own. Light snoring was coming from Peter's, but James and Sirius were still awake. If Remus concentrated very hard, he could even sense how they were lying, James on his back tossing his lucky golden snitch up and down, Sirius curled up on his side, and how relaxed they were. Not at all. That felt like an invasion of privacy, though, so he just tried to creep as quietly as possible to his own four-poster, looking forward to a proper rest at last. No such luck. Remus! Sirius's head popped out from behind his curtains. Remus turned his head. Sirius? he whispered back. Sirius pulled back the curtain, and, after a quick glance at the other beds, Remus climbed in as neatly as he could. Inside it was pitch dark, but he could still see Sirius's warm outline kneeling before him. He twitched his wand. Sonoro quiesis. James isn't asleep yet, Remus cautioned. Are you sure you want me to... Yes, Sirius replied. Please stay, just for a bit. 
He reached out and grasped Remus's hand, squeezing it. Remus relented and finally put his arms around Sirius, pulling him closer. It was an immense relief. I'm so sorry about Rig. He's not even of age. I know. They pulled apart and sat cross-legged, facing each other. Sirius's head was bowed, his hair covering his face. He probably remembered how well Remus could see in the dark. I can't believe... I know it's stupid. I should have known all along that he would, but... I don't know. I just suppose I just hoped he'd... It's not stupid, Remus said. And we don't know he joined willingly. Remember what they did to you, when they wanted you to join him? Sirius flinched, but didn't move away. Yeah, he murmured. I doubt it went that far with Reg. He was always... He always wanted it more than me. The whole circus. Our parents' approval. The respect you get from pure bloods for just being a black. We like to be popular and powerful. It only makes sense. That's why we're all Slytherins. You're not a Slytherin. No, I'm not. Sirius exhaled shakily. I used to think... What? I used to think... Maybe I didn't get sorted into Gryffindor because I'm brave or chivalrous like James is. Maybe I just wasn't welcome in Slytherin because I haven't got the ambition. Ambition? Remus stared at him. Serious, what Reg is doing, it's not... It's not anything to be proud of. It's cowardly. He's doing exactly what he's been raised to do, without thinking, without questioning. Yeah, but... And you're the bravest person I know. Mooney. Really? Remus said this with such seriousness that it stopped Sirius in his tracks. Thank you. Sirius smiled. He reached forward again, plucking the fabric of Remus's pyjama bottoms and sniffing slightly. I thought that keeping quiet about you and me would be the hardest thing about this year, he said. The god about this stupid war. Yeah. Remus wasn't sure how to respond. He wished he could forget about the war, too. Sirius looked up at him, sensing his unease. It's still hard, he said. Keeping this quiet? His fingers kept playing with the cuffs of Remus's trouser leg. I feel like we're so far apart when the others are around. We're pretty close now, Remus offered, hoping to cheer him up a bit. It worked. Sirius took this as an invitation and finally met his eye, grinning. He leaned over, and as their lips met, Remus forced himself to forget about everything else, just for a bit. Afterwards, they found themselves crawling under the covers for warmth, sleepy and affectionate. I shouldn't get too comfortable, Remus yawned. I'd better get back to my bed. Not yet, Sirius whispered shyly. Okay. His eyes were very heavy, though. He was in real danger of falling asleep. Remus? Hmm. Tell me a secret. Sirius's fingers curled round his. Um, I don't know. Go on. Something good. Happy. Uh. Perhaps now was the right time. He didn't like to bring up the Black family, but after all, it wasn't something about Regulus or Walpurga. I could tell you about something I did in my second year, if you won't get angry. What did you do? Promise me you won't get angry. It's a bit... Well, I remember I was thirteen, and I only wanted to help. Merlin, Mooney, just tell me. Narcissa, he said. I, um... I gave her the idea to use the unbreakable vow. You know, to get out of the engagement. The engagement. Not your engagement. Because that was still too painful. Sirius was quiet. Remus bit his lip and turned his head onto the pillow to get a look at Sirius's face. I'm really sorry for interfering, but you gave me that reading spell and you were so... I just thought you were so amazing and clever and brave. I wanted to do something to help you for once. But you didn't want me to know about it. Uh, uh no, I didn't. At first I didn't want to boast about it. Then so much time had passed, it just didn't seem worth it. Mooney! Sirius exhaled again, exasperated this time. Honestly, you and your secrets! I'm sorry. 
Don't be sorry, Sirius chuckled, yawning again and shifting slightly to get comfortable. I suppose I did ask. And that's bloody impressive. I couldn't have come up with that at thirteen. Well, you didn't, Remus smirked. So you actually went and talked to my cousin? Yeah, she was terrifying. Still is, Sirius snorted. They all bloody are. Don't think about it now, Remus chastised him, or I'll have to cheer you up again and I can't think of any more secrets tonight. There are other ways, Sirius replied slyly. Remus laughed, hoping the silencing spell was still secure. Harlot! Thank you for watching, and a very special thank you to our supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can head over to our Patreon or check out some of the official Bibliobabuli merch. If you're new here, consider subscribing, and until the next video, happy reading.